You're now listening to Sanity at the Movies, Inconceivable Edition, because it's inconceivable that this podcast won't be the greatest podcast that you've ever listened to. It's on a classic movie that pretty much everyone loves, except for the people that don't, and there's definitely the contingent of people for whom the whimsy of this particular movie just does not hit and they really don't like it it's, or they're just grumpy jerks yeah grumpy jerks i think that's the, the name of that category of people yeah yeah but but there's definitely i mean i think they resent things that are good right like oh this is good and everybody loves it but you know i can be one of those people sometimes but i'm not with the princess bride because i'm not actually a grumpy jerk i just play one on tv all right speaking of me my name is nathan i'm your humble and obedient host <sighs> happy to be here anybody want a peanut land war in asia Catchphrases. This movie has them. I'll tell you who else is here. Speaking of catchphrases. A man all wrapped up in a Holocaust cloak. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> I think a thing just invented for this movie. I mean, I think it's a cloak, it's, but I think it's not actually a thing. But I always wondered about it, and then I looked it up on the internet one day, and I was like, oh, I guess they just made it up. Because it's not like there's cloaks from the Holocaust, and it's not like this weird, very Jewish movie would be referencing them in this capacity if there were. But Holocaust can also mean like flames, and so I think the fact that they set it on fire is is where mm -hmm. Holocaust yep. comes from. Makes sense to me when they turn Andre into a monster. Anyway, he's a man. He's the, he's the Holocaust cloak of people because he's always burning with passion as we do these podcasts. His name is especially when we talk about a great movie like Princess Bride, and his name, of course, the Dread Pirate Benjamin Solzer. Hello. Hey. Hey. <laughs> How's it going there, man? It, it's it's good, you know. The Dread Pirate Benjamin Solser takes some survivor, survivors. I take survivors. You leave you leave some survivors. I leave some survivors. Leave some survivors. Yeah, you take I, some prisoners. I do. I take yeah. some prisoners. I leave some survivors. By, by the way, can we just say this movie neatly sidesteps the question of how many innocent people Wesley has killed <laughs> <laughs> and how many innocent people he is inducting Inigo into beginning to murder Never, never, never dresses it one way or another. But. I, I, I thought it seemed like if you could actually go on the ship, everyone would actually end up surviving. Like the Dread Pirate like Roberts is just a really nice guy. It basically, yeah. that's yeah. what I, I, yeah, I like, that, I like I that reason. Definitely false. Yeah. Definitely false. <laughs> yeah. You think Wesley murdered <laughs> hundreds of innocent people? Yeah, I think he had to. I think that's part of the shtick. And now he's saying that Inigo would be really good at yeah. mur murdering. <sighs> well, I don't know. We'll decide. At the end of this podcast, we'll decide. And if we don't, if we go with Jake's version, then we will be forced to say this is a most wicked movie that no one should watch. Uh -huh. And speaking of Jake, why don't you introduce yeah. him? And the two of you might not survive. If, yeah. If I'm, that's who I've got to be modeled after. Yeah, you're the so. red pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Kinda, you can always kill us in the morning. Put the nails in your own coffin there, my friend. Yes, it is the man, the myth, the legend, Jacob Mensel. He's been studying podcasting for years to avenge his father. Yeah, yeah, my my a, a podcast did kill your father, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> six fingered podcast. <laughs> right, <laughs> my name is Jacob K. Mensel. You are the man who I I forget how it goes, but anyway, it's Jake. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jake Mensel. Wow, that's really great. Uh, clever. My name that, is that is actually what I say. My name is Jacob K. Mensel. <laughs> I forget how it goes. Yeah, because <laughs> you can't remember how it goes. <laughs> My name yep. is Jacob K. Menzel. You're the man. <laughs> hey, you're the man who killed my father. Now Prepared you're to die. die. Prepared to die. No, my name is Anigo Montoya. You killed my you father. Killed my father. <laughs> you killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> Prepare to die. Hey, you're the man that killed my father. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, guys, we are talking Offer me fame. Offer me power. Offer me everything Offer I want. Me. I don't like how that moment plays out. Although I like the fact that obviously he gets his revenge and it's very satisfying, but I do, I do not like a certain aspect of that scene, and I guess we'll talk about it when we get there. That's a little hook for the podcast. All right. But Princess Bride. We're talking about the Princess Bride, a movie that came out in 1987, and this is part of our Staff Picks series. Will some, would somebody explain the Staff Picks and what we're doing, just in case this is someone's first podcast? Yeah, basically what happened is... Nathan and Ben picked a terrible Nick Cage movie that nobody had ever seen to watch. And I said, we should watch movies that people know and like. It's... And then we can have a staff picks where you pick terrible movies that nobody's ever seen before. Right. I remember that happening that and way. And then 
And everybody's like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Jake we'll, has a very, we'll, very, we'll, very we'll considered that. narrative. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't think. Everybody's yeah. like, yeah, that's great. We'll do that. And then it's I decided spin. to pick the Princess Bride because I thought it would be fun. Yep. Hoisted on. <laughs> I'm not hoisted we, on any petard. I think so hoisted you, you on just our hoisted own us. UFO. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I, what I remember happening is we picked a really cool underwatched Nick Cage movie. And right. We talked about that. Or, like, so we, I'm trying to remember what other movie Jake could be. Basically, we were like, everybody already has one Christmas day. Let's give them a second one where they open the gift of this Nick Cage movie that they have never watched. Knowing. Yeah, knowing. Yeah. Is the name of the movie. It sounded like you were... I had totally forgotten the name of the movie. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't pull it. I've forgotten. Mm. Oh, man. What a fantastic movie. Check it out, folks. If you like creepy, UFO, apocalyptic, quasi-religious thrillers with Nick Cage, I dare say this will be one of your favorite ones. It has UFOs in it? Well, kind of. <laughs> Spoilers, Jake. Remember, they, they, they could be the angels, maybe, or... The kids go on a voyage at the end. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> it's <is> pretty awesome. <laughs> I was trying to remember. Spoilers. Like yeah. Some Oops. kind of E.T. meets uh, Close Encounters. Yeah. E.T. meets Close Encounters just sounds like two groups of similar aliens meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well, saying... Well, you would have knowing, but Nick Cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, guys, we're talking about The Princess Bride. It's Jake's staff pick. Last time we did my staff pick safety last which by the way i wanted to follow up on that real quick because you showed that movie to your children and your family I did. we we had like an hour or so to kill uh one evening and far be it from the mental family to talk to each other to read books well so what happened was we had we had started a movie we'd started kiki's delivery service yeah and realized after i started it we got a late start and it's actually a pretty long movie. Yeah. And so I just decided, you know what? We'll cut this off. We'll finish it some other time. And so it was like a time to finish the movie. So we finished it. And since we only had like an hour left and it was still early, I was like, well, we could do something else. And so I was already in HBO max with Kiki's delivery service. So I flipped over and flipped on safety last 99 year old silent comedy. No introduction, no comment, no nothing. I just put it on and press play. And it, uh, it entertains my family top to bottom the whole way through. Got good laughs all the way through. Like just everybody was laughing and enjoying themselves. My almost 14 year old son wasn't too good for it. It was pretty fun. Yeah. Amanda was engaged. So Which was it his, totally worked. What's his face is going to make it up that building. I mean, it's a, yeah. that's awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. 99 years ago, Harold Lloyd did something that can still speak to your family and reasonably hold their attention for an hour and change. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's pretty great. I dare say that's more than we could say for most of the famous Charlie Chaplin movies as good as they might be. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but yeah, they're very sentimental. And that could get pretty tiresome for children, I would think. Buster Keaton, I don't know. We'll litigate that some Buster other time. Keaton may just be a little more abstract, and that might have its own issue. Right. There's just something about him. But the general? The yeah. general's like a super fun, I don't know. I would think so. I would I safety know. last played just like a good, entertaining cartoon. It got all the same laughs that we gave it, that we talked about. So him crawling behind the cart was a big hit. Yeah. That was the first really big hit, I think. <laughs> But any number of the gags while he's climbing, you know, it's a lot of fun for everybody. Hmm. Oh, man. Cool. You, just, you just made me remember some of those gags, like when the board comes out and it yep. grabs his body. That's intense. It's pretty intense. Well, speaking of intense, let's talk about an exciting, intense action adventure movie, The Princess Bride. Yay. Yeah. Hey, guys, a little context on The Princess Bride. Is every, either one of you familiar with the screenwriter slash novelist who wrote the novel The Princess Bride, William Goldman? I know that he's a man. Mm-hmm. I also know he's a man. William Goldman said, and I think this is probably on his tombstone. It's a quote that you hear all the time if you read about movies, if you're a cinephile. He said, this is the one piece of wisdom that you ever need to know about Hollywood, and it's become a very famous aphorism in the business, and the aphorism is nobody knows anything and so why was titanic the biggest movie of all time why do people like superhero movies now instead of later why were westerns so big and then why did westerns go away why do why does a movie like 
what's it called? What's that dance? Why did every musical flop last year? West Side or West Side Story? What was that mm-hmm. Lin Manuel Miranda thing? I can't pull it. In the Heights. In the uh. Heights. Tick tick boom boom. Whatever. <laughs> why did people just decide? You, you can you can speculate all you want. You can say there's no audience because of COVID. Older people aren't going to the theater. But William Goldman says nobody knows anything. No matter how much you speculate, you'll you'll never figure it out. Which is the Hollywood aphorism. It's just like you talk to any Hollywood insider or critic or anybody. And well, the, there's always that counter example. Right. Why did the musicals? Why did a Spielberg musical flop? Why did a Lin Manuel Miranda musical flop? Nobody was at the theaters, really, because Spider Man No Way Home definitely is the second highest grossing film of all time, and it was released between those two. Right. Exactly. And you could say kids go to the theaters. Kids love Spider Man. 40-year-old women who would listen to West Side Story all the time just weren't going to the theaters. Fair enough. You can always speculate. But, you know, everybody thought Spielberg would have the clout to pull him in if anybody would. Kids like Spider-Man. But the reason that Spider-Man No No Way Home was about to top the all-time box office charts is because people who grew up with Tobey Maguire were going to see it. Right. And therefore, it's made double the amount of money that Shang-Chi made. Which is another and significantly more money than any other Tom Holland Spider Man made. Right. And by the way, that's double the second highest grossing movie of 2021, Shang Chi was. But William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. William Goldman is one of the great personalities of Hollywood. I just want to talk a, a little bit about him because he's interesting and he's influential. And I think he's influential on the kinds of things that we like. I think you could argue that he gave us the Marvel movies, that he gave us. I don't know, probably the whole attitude of this podcast. Basically, William Goldman gave that nebuchy Jewish sense of self-awareness hmm. to the movies. And he did it through a movie that you've probably heard of or seen, called, which I don't particularly like, but Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, I don't really think holds up. I don't know. You guys seen Butch Cassidy? You like mm-hmm. Butch Cassidy? Mm, I don't know if I really like it, but I've definitely seen it. I even wrote a paper about it once in film class. Hey, there you go. That's the kind of movie you write. Which which can be a way to bring you to dislike a movie. Right. It can be a good way. Hey, write a paper about this movie. Yeah. Well, that is arguably, I mean, that is like the thing. Like Lethal Weapon is downstream of that. Die mm-hmm. Hard is downstream of that. That's the movie where they're going to jump off the off a cliff and say, oh, crap. They don't actually say crap mm-hmm. in the movie, but like just the whole Joss whedon attitude the whole kind of we're in a movie and we're ma- we're a wisecracken and we're kind of doing a play on a genre piece mm-hmm. i don't know i mean you can always find it would be absurd for me to try to pin all of this one thing on this one movie you can always find examples but butch cassidy was the most popular movie in 1969 and i really think it defined the whole tone of of modern moviedom. There's no Joss Whedon without it. There's no Lethal Weapon without it. There's no Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's no Robert Downey Jr. There's no, like, like I said, there's probably no this podcast. Just, there's no the internet. There's no, like, just self aware, ironic, I dare say Jewish sensibilities William Goldman helped give us. Um, and, and Butch Cassidy was huge in 1969. But backing up a little bit, he is, we don't have to go into his life too much, but he is a, a Jewish man who came from Jewish parents and I think fought in one of the wars. I forget which one, but became famous as a novelist first, not as a really popular New York Times bestseller. Like we've all heard of his novels. I think the only one that's really survived has been The Princess Bride. And I think probably it survived because everybody loves the movie to be honest. Mm-hmm. But but he was a workman, journeyman novelist who wrote novels that were popular enough. Things like, and many of them were later made into movies like Marathon Man. You've probably at least heard the title of. I've seen that one. Um, it's got the famous dentist scene where, yes, it does. where he tortures Dustin Hoffman by ripping his teeth out. And it's got the famous anecdote that we always like to repeat on this podcast where mm-hmm. Laurence Olivier said, try acting, my dear boy, for that very <laughs> famous scene, which is the best anecdote Maybe of all time, but certainly the best Hollywood anecdote. So William Goldman sort of just breaks into the trade as a workman novelist and then breaks into Hollywood based on that, writes some detective screenplays, some genre stuff. But then in 1969 or or leading up to 1969, when Butch Cassidy comes out, he 
he kind of did the the thing that Shane Black would later do with the first script for Lethal Weapon. Every five ten years, somebody sells a script for a huge amount of money. It floats around. Pulp Fiction was this way. That dumb movie that I hate with the two Irish guys was this way. Oh, yeah, I hate that uh, the Boondock Saints oh, was this Saints. way. In the '90s, Harvey Weinstein was always finding the next bartender who had the script that was going to change the industry. Huh. And some of them, like Pulp Fiction, did for better or for worse. Boondock Saints kind of did. Yeah. Sort of, maybe? I don't uh, know. But William Goldman was kind of the first one where he was making headlines, not just in the in, in industry papers, but in like regular newspapers because he'd gotten the exorbitant amount of $400,000 hmm. for the screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid because it felt so new and so fresh. And it's the story of these real outlaws. It's filtered through a western i don't know whether this is a movie that our audience will have seen have you seen butch cassidy Jake? I, I feel like i've seen parts of it it's kind of a dad movie it, yeah. a little yeah, bit definitely it's the kind of thing that would be on tv back when people had tv yeah i feel like i've seen parts of it like on tnt or something right like it's, it's definitely that kind of movie but it, but it was just huge and again it tells this story but but it does the crucial thing of playing sideways to the material just enough while also being sincere enough with the material i mean it really is the template for marvel i don't think i'm being hyperbolic when i say that like hmm. how can we kid the material and do the material at the same time and wring all the emotion that you would usually get out of the material but also have fun with it and kind of wink at the fact that we're in a movie so that's butch cassidy butch cassidy is huge launches william goldman on a very famous career or, or a very prestigious career where he just wrote a lot of movies, most of which didn't become classics. He kind of got sucked into the system and became a script doctor. And so he helped throughout the 90s. He was, he was a script doctor, which obviously I think just means if somebody doesn't know what script doctor is, somebody who comes in and fixes a, a script. The script isn't quite working for your popular movie. You hire somebody, probably usually their name doesn't even end up on the credits, but he, he doctored things like, a few good men, basically all your favorite. Another Rob Reiner movie. Another Rob Reiner, which I'll get to Rob Reiner in a second. Yeah. But William Goldman, he just had a nice touch. He had a nice way with dialogue. He had a nice way with character. All all of his qualities, and he had a nice what we now call meta, or what we ten years ago called meta. Maybe there's a new word for it now. He's had a nice self aware. Again, I don't think it's unfair for me to say Jewish sensibility. Why am I saying Jewish sensibility? Uh, do you think any of our audience doesn't understand what I mean when I say that? I don't know. I mean, I guess, how would you explain that if somebody... Ironic. There's a certain kind of humor. Rye ironic. Rye ironic, gallows humor. I mean, it's not dissimilar to an Irish sensibility or it's kind of like, uh, this is not me being blasphemous. This is what they would say. It's, it's like, God has treated us poorly. I mean, we've had a rough time of it. And so we've decided to have a sense of humor. Just one darn thing after another happens to our people. And what are you going to do? But kind of be self-aware. It's Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof, the mm -hmm. conversations that he has with God, you know, mm -hmm. oh, you're doing this to me again. You know, is that wry attitude about life and about the existential drama that we all find ourselves in? I really think William Goldman brought that to the movie. It's not like you couldn't say Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca has some of that, or you know, it's not like William Goldman was the first person to bring irony to the movies, but Butch Cassidy is just so, such a perfect and such a popular meta textual ironic artifact of its time, and it was pretty influential. But then William Goldman becomes a script doctor. Works the, the other thing he's famous for is all the President's Men. He worked on that. And that's the other one that might be on his tombstone, along with Princess Bride and Butch. And then he. Worked on any number of things, oftentimes uncredited, that you may or may not heard of, have heard of. Had a little something to do with helping Affleck and Damon make Goodwill Hunting into what it was. Told them to get rid of the subplot where the CIA was trying to induct Mr. Goodwill Hunting into its ranks because of his super brain powers, which is arguably a pretty smart move for a script doctor to do. Although maybe I would have liked Goodwill Hunting better if it had a if CIA is after Goodwill Hunting subplot because I hate that movie. But it's not your fault. It's not my fault. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one of the worst. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that whole whole. Oh, a psychologist can fix all my problems in in one session just by telling me it's not my fault. Great. Like, why don't we all just hire a therapist to do that for us? Mm -hmm. What a load of crock that movie is. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Well. It's not your fault, Jake. 
<laughs> the, the other thing that William Goldman is famous for and that was very influential on me personally is he wrote books about his time in the industry and he was just really honest and very funny about the way that movies were made. He wrote a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade and another book called Which Lie Did I Tell? And he just talked about how movies get made and what the process was like of being a screenwriter, watching his ideas get twisted around what stars want and the sensibilities of the people that he had to work with. And if you want an accurate, funny look into how it actually works and the business of it all and the way that great ideas get corrupted by going through the machine that is Hollywood, you just cannot do better than those books. They are really entertaining. I don't know who among our audience has time to read a book just about one man's experience in Hollywood. But if you wanted to read one, William Goldman, I mean, I'm sure he's probably crude and profane in some places and is talking about a crude and profane industry. So let me not recommend it with no caveats, but he wrote some pretty fantastic, some of the best books about Hollywood insider. Good enough that he kind of became persona non grata for, for a <laughs> while in Hollywood because he was just too honest about... I, I remember he talk, he wrote a thing about the disaster that was you guys remember that movie the ghost in the darkness the val uh -huh. Kilmer li yeah. lion hunting movie I remember liking no. that as a, as a teenager <laughs> well he just talked about working with michael douglas and how michael douglas was originally a producer and they were doing all these cool things where you were never going to know the backstory of this character and it was going to be really artfully done and and michael douglas was all on board with it but then michael douglas decided to play the character and suddenly hey well bill we need you to come in and write a sympathetic backstory for this guy and it's like we're gonna corrupt he tells story after story in his book of stars egos stars needing to be the heroes of these stories and how that often corrupts what otherwise would have been a good story because screenwriters just have very little control over what happens to their their product so you can't just it's not about what makes the best story it's about what makes michael douglas look good or <laughs> robert redford or or whoever in 1973, he wrote the novel The Princess Bride, and it is the thing that he put the most of his heart into, and he loved it and always talked about how much he loved it and how sincerely he loved the characters, however kind of ironic he is. You know, we can talk about how much the movie is kidding and how much the movie is being sincere, but William Goldman, I think, loves Buttercup, loves Wesley. He tells the story of killing Wesley in the pit of despair, and then looking up from his typewriter and saying, oh my gosh, I've killed Wesley, bursting into tears and being inconsolable for a couple of days until he solved the problem of how to bring Wesley back. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so he loves, he loves this material and I think really loves it unironically. But he also has, have you read the book for The Princess Bride, Ben? No, I, no, I've not read it. No. I kind of would like to now. So I, the, so I know plenty of people who have. But. It's fantastic. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more serious. Obviously, it doesn't have Billy Crystal show up two-thirds of the way through and just do Billy Crystal jokes. I wouldn't mind. What? Yeah, I, 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 we'll get to that. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but but and also what it, it lacks, the movie is so clever and wonderful in giving us this grandfather wraparound story. But there's no reason for the book to have the grandfather wraparound story. What the book has is the wraparound story of a man written from the first person called William Goldman. He just writes it as if he's himself. And he's talking about how much he loved the book by L. Morgenstern, or whatever the guy's name is, called The Princess Bride, and how his dad used to read it to him. <laughs> and he goes on and on about how, what a great adventure story it was. And then Bill Goldman finally gets his hands on a copy of The Princess Bride and realizes that it's just this boring political treatise on how stupid the people of Florin were or how like it, like it's it's this long boring book and so William Goldman and so if you if you find a copy he of tells the, it as uh, yeah he basically cuts out all the parts that his dad used to cut out when he was and just makes it into a great adventure story and so to this day if you find the book in, in your bookstore it will say the princess bride by lm morgenstern or whatever abridged by william gold which is a, which is just a big meta joke but he has a lot of fun with it he will stop in the middle of the book and say here's a here's another part where morgan stern just goes on about florin's <laughs> politics and makes some great satirical points but i cut them all out so that we can get to the pit of despair <laughs> so he he just has a lot of fun with that kind of thing and and it is fun the 25th edition would come out and he would talk about and he wrote a new introduction where he had visited morgan stern's estate and seen different things and he just always had 
fun with it. He talked about the sequel, Buttercup's Baby, and how that had never been abridged. And he, he, <laughs> maybe he, he, one day he'll get to he, it. Maybe one day he'll get to it. And you can find <laughs> excerpts of Buttercup's Baby. You used to, at a certain point, be able to actually... It had a thing you could write into the publisher, Hot and Pufflin or whoever it is. What's the one I'm thinking of? Penguin, whoever it was. You could write to them to get Buttercup's Baby. <laughs> I like Hot and Pufflin. Hot, hot and Puffin. But, but, cotton, cotton Pufflin. But, but if you wrote to them, what you cotton would puffin. get is this form letter where William Goldman talked about how he couldn't get the rights from Morgan Stern's estate. And so he, has, he just had a lot of fun with, uh, with the meta joke of, of the whole thing. And it is a lot of fun. And William Goldman is so charming at that kind of stuff. It's the same attitude that he brings to that book, Adventures in the Screen trade where he's just really wry and sarcastic and so fun to read and the kind of guy that just talks directly to you as an as a as a as a reader and just tells you what he thinks and talks in his own kind of voice and he's just he's just a very charming guy to read which comes through in spades and every character in this movie i mean he just has a little bit of that that sense in real life that grumpy (laughs) miracle max kind of sense but he did take. He does also take the story sincerely, which is important. And it ca- came out of, as these things often do, a story that he was telling to his daughter. He had two daughters, and in the most stereotypical way possible, he said, "What do you want your bedtime story to be?" And one of them said she wanted a story about a princess, and the other one said she wanted a story about a bride. And so he put them together and made the princess bride. And I think he started writing it as a straight book, and he couldn't find a way into it and then he came up with the idea that it's actually an abridgment of somebody else's work and that <laughs> allowed him to and it's great i mean it's it's such a wonderful conceit because it allows him to just skip certain things and just be like well now the plot goes here because i want it to and obviously morgan stern did a lot of work but we're cutting all that out because who cares um so so it's just it's it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun and i think it's a fantastic way that he found of at adapting it um into the whole grandfather story in the movie. But a lot of, but that came out in 1973. The novel did. Everybody loved it. Everybody wanted to adapt it. Lots of people worked on adaptations. You can know how much Goldman loved the material because he sold it to Hollywood. They couldn't figure out how to adapt it. And then he bought it back with his own money, <laughs> which you never hear about people doing wow. because he's just like, I'm not going to let people ruin my baby. Finally, Rob Reiner, of all people, convinced Goldman that he was the right guy to do it. And Rob Reiner, probably most of our audience knows, was meathead on All in the Family. The sitcom was a sitcom actor, a son of Hollywood royalty. Carl Reiner was a great comedic director and Mel Brooks' best friend until he died just recently. And Rob Reiner is just like a son of Hollywood. But the important thing is to know about Rob Reiner, moving to him for a second, is that he directed all of your dad's favorite movies. I mean, seriously, he did Spinal Tap, Sure Thing, Stand By Me, Princess Bride, A Few Good Men, The American President. Mm -hmm. It's just like if something's playing on TNT on a Saturday morning, chances are Rob (laughs) Reiner directed. If if it's not John Wayne and your dad and mom kind of like it, then uh, chances are Rob Reiner directed it. He's just like he he doesn't have Spielberg's talent, but he has (laughs) Spielberg's populist instinct to this day he just he did the bucket list which i don't think is supposed to be a very good movie i never saw it but people sure liked it and mm-hmm. you know responded to, to it and he got two big stars to and then bucket list is a thing we all know what a bucket list is now mm-hmm. so rob reiner just a great populist and a very clever comedian at the time i'm spinal tap is a very funny sarcastic wry dry movie and that's what he would have showed william goldman to say do you think I can do Princess Bride? And the great thing about Spinal Tap, which is a fake rock documentary, if people haven't seen it, is it plays as a completely sincere rock documentary. It hits all the beats. It hits them with a certain silly emotional reality. And you're actually sad when the band is going to break up and then you're happy when they make it work. And it actually feels so much like a real rock documentary that many people took it seriously when it came out and didn't realize it was funny. But it's also a huge goof on the whole culture of of rock bands yeah that's one i've always heard about always but never seen it it spoofs things that are gross about rock bands and so i'm sure it has profane language and stuff like that in fact i know it does but but it is very funny and christopher guest who plays count rugen in this movie is hilarious in it as the lead singer of spinal tap 
great comedic actor and went on to do a lot of those fake documentaries like Waiting for Guffman and Best in Show and stuff like that. But yeah, Rob Reiner, just this great populist director. I don't know what else to say about him. I mean, he he's not like, like I said, he's not he's not Spielberg level talent or anything like that, but he certainly knows how to pick his screenplays and pick his collaborators and just put together a package that can't fail. Hey, let's mm. put Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan both at their prime together Terry and Metzelli. just have them bounce off of each other for an hour and a half and then kiss. Mm-hmm. Great. Works. It's undeniable. Let's get Aaron Sorkin to write a screenplay about the president. Right. Absolutely. Undeniable. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's make it a dumb sitcom premise where the president falls in love with a lady and it's so annoyingly Sorkin-y. But falls in love with a, what, a lobbyist? A maybe? lobbyist from yeah. the... I, I can't. I cannot claim that the American president is actually a good movie. Let's get Martin but, Sheen in to play I, the vice president. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I've never seen it. Yeah. It, it's, 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 <laughs> the only word for it is it's undeniable. It just works. It's very charming. You can't... <laughs> it's all built around one conceit and it's it's actually just the turn, the idea that He's going to go off into love la la land and then he's going to re-engage and say, have his line, I am the president. I am Because his opponent who's like gaining ground is like, my name is Don Rumsfeld and I'm running for president. And I'm played by Weasley, what's his face? Uh, <laughs> Steve Buscemi. <laughs> no, it's no. not. I know. Uh, <laughs> that was just a funny thought. No, it's uh... <laughs> just because he looks like a weasel, Ben. <laughs> What's his name? He's uh, the obnoxious guy from Jaws and all those things. Close Encounters. Richard Dreyfuss. Yeah, oh, it's Richard yeah. Dreyfuss. Man. Yeah, Bob Rumsfeld. And, you know, and then you get Catherine Zeta-Jones' husband. What's his name? Michael Douglas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. We've so, been talking about him. but Yeah. yeah he, Michael Douglas, the blah, 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 blah. And I am the president. <laughs> very Aaron Sorkin. It's so uh-huh. Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> but it also has the very Rob Reiner touch slash Aaron Sorkin touch but the president's just a dude he's gonna call and try and get flowers for his girlfriend and the florist isn't gonna understand he's not gonna believe him think it's a prank call and but he wants to do it himself instead of instead of having aid do it and yeah what if the president was just a person (laughs) whose wife died and he's caught in the romance right while trying to be the president cool and yeah, can, well, the turn in though, it, when he like reengages, is like he's got the plan for gun control, and he's got the plan for like five other things on the on a liberal <laughs> agenda. Yeah, it's, so it so it so it's, it would make a good the lobbyist like wants a crime bill or something like right. that. Right. Okay. Or, so so it would make a good double showing. What's what do, double what do you feature? Call there we go. Double yeah. feature with Dave. Yes. Yes. It's <laughs> Dave, which I, I loved. As, the, I like loved as a Ke- kid. Kevin Klein or Kevin Klein and Sigourney Weaver. Wow. Who actually have pretty good chemistry, it must be said. It must be said. It mu- <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get through The Prince's Bride without saying that Kevin Klein and Sigourney Weaver have great chemistry in Dave. <laughs> you know, as far as people from that Sorry, era, folks. I like both of those people. I mean, they p- yeah. played in some crummy movies, but I'm always happy to see Kevin Klein or Sigourney Weaver. And two great tastes taste great together. Peanut butter chocolate. So yeah, Rob Reiner loves the novel. He convinces Goldman to let him do it. And casts the other thing that Rob Reiner is so undeniably good at is just casting. I mean, you you can't do better than Douglas and Sheen and the American president and at Benning. You can't do better than Crystal and Ryan and Harry Met Sally. The Stand By Me boys are all perfect. I mean, Rob Reiner just always picked the best people. And I think mm. so much of The Princess Bride is like, we've got good material by Goldman and then we just cast the perfect people and you can almost just coast after that like who cares just set up the camera and have these people do it because they're perfect and they're all kind of i think carrie Uli- Ule's, however you say his name elways was just becoming a thing he'd only done one or two movies before but rob reiner saw him rob robin wright was like doing soap operas or something she Nobody knew who she was, and they, they they looked at everybody for Buttercup, and you can find the fun stories of the big stars that they didn't hire to be hmm. Buttercup, but cast found, the perfect unknown. Yeah, they found, and in, in Goldman's novel, she's described as the most beautiful girl in the world, and all this stuff. So you have to have somebody who can play that kind of part, who is in fact the most beautiful girl in the world, and um, can but can also bring some energy and some real personality and. Carrie Ulysses and Robin Wright are perfect for that. And then 
Wally Shawn, who was just a theater actor as Vizzini is so amazing and, and not who you would think of for that part necessarily. I think they were trying to get kind of perfect. He's so perfect. I, I mean, he is my favorite part of that movie. He's just, he's undeniable to use my new favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I lit it, litigate him and I find him undeniable. Thanks, CJ. <laughs> <laughs> All those parts are so perfect. I mean, Andre the Giant, Very William nice. Goldman actually wrote Andre the Giant. Like, he didn't write Andre the Giant, but he, he was picturing Andre the Giant when he wrote the part of, what's the giant's name in the thing? Fezzik? Yep. And so he always wanted Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant couldn't really act, but he was a performer. He was a wrestler, and those guys always know how to perform. And he just had such a sweet personality that it just uplifts any part of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I could go on and on and list mm -hmm. all the people, but... Uh, Mandy Patinkin. Mandy Patinkin, more known as a singer at the time. Yeah, but these guys are, they're, they're just all, they're just all so perfect. I don't, I don't know that I have any particular context to add about any one of them, except for Ryan just cast, the, or yeah, Ryan, Rob Reiner cast the heck out of this thing. And then he's a workman, like kind of pedestrian director. He's not much of a visual stylist or anything mm -hmm. like that. I wouldn't say that. And we can talk about how successful we think everything is in this movie through more cynical adult eyes. But point is, he's always going to, he's always going to pick good mainstream popular material in the best sense of the word, like the best kind of populist material, bring a little extra charm and a few extra drafts of that screenplay to make it really sparkle. And then he's going to cast the right people. And Rob Ryan has just been made a really successful career out of doing that kind of thing. And that brings us to The Princess Bride. I guess the only other piece of context is it was a critical darling. The critics loved it. But th when it came out in, what did I say, 87, the, the, the studio just did not know how to sell it. Like, is this a comedy? Is this an adventure? Do we pitch it to kids? Do we pitch it to cynical adults? Like, who is this movie for? So it kind of had... And I think Goldman is on record as saying to Reiner at the time, like, hey, man, I really don't want this to be the next Wizard of Oz, and I feel like it's, it's in danger of being, and of course, that's exactly what happened. Nobody cared at the time, and then it caught on on home video mm -hmm. um, and was just a big VHS. Moved a lot of VHSs, moved mm -hmm. a lot of cassette tapes in the time, and I think most people that I know saw it on VHS or saw it on some version of home video, and uh, like Shawshank Redemption, like any a handful of movies people just got to kind of discover it for themselves and had fun with it that way. So I think that adds an additional layer of charm, maybe adds an additional layer of blowback now because just like Christmas story, just like any number of things, just like Shawshank in some sense, they, they become overexposed after like a generation discovers it and says, this is the best thing ever. And then, and then really pushes it on the next generation. I don't feel like I've ever, I've had, I've heard of comparable blowback to Christmas story or, whatever the other one I just named. Even Shawshank. even Shawshank, people love Shawshank, but it feels like it's not as beloved as it was <laughs> maybe a decade ago or 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but Princess Bride, people don't seem to tire of. It's, it's just a perennial favorite and everybody loves it and it's a classic and we're here to tell you what a true piece of garbage it is. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> Twist. <laughs> no, it's great. Ben, what are your general big picture thoughts on... The Princess Bride, and what context or uh, what, what baggage do you bring to The Princess Bride? I saw it when I was a kid, saw it a bunch of times. Remember the famous torture machine scene with the apples rolling yes. down? <laughs> yes, I forgot about <laughs> that. That big part of the yeah. mechanism. <laughs> right. Um, I fabricated that memory for some reason. I don't know why. I liked The Princess Bride as a kid. I liked it a lot this time. I don't know if I'd seen it the whole thing as an adult. I was trying to remember if I had. Maybe not. So did maybe, it, yeah. Did it strike you much differently? Like, were you laughing at a bunch of stuff that you used to find exciting or no I, I don't think so i think that uh, i think as a kid i remember finding the whole thing no no i can't i can't i can't reconstruct what i thought as a kid so i just i liked it yeah. i enjoyed it a lot not much more to say till we get to the specifics i think it was a lot of fun yeah i grew up with it and have always loved it and part of why it's my staff pick and it, yeah i was gonna say and no, no particular reason beyond a little bit of vindictiveness that we talked about last week. And yeah, I mean, I guess if people are coming fresh to this. It was a little vindictive. I wanted to do a different movie, and I got sidelined. And 
I actually, the vindictive part is, it's kind of movie that Nathan actually, I know he's multiple times been, we love it, it's great, but likes to be annoyed by or talk about it being annoying or talk about the popularity of it being annoying. Yes, I'll get to that in a second. But so yeah, that was part of my it was a little vindictive and a little and part of it too was just like wouldn't it be funny if instead of picking something obscure I picked something that everybody's seen. Right. I was really pushing for you to make us do Robert Redford's The Natural or or some weird sports movie that nobody's seen, which there is really no weird sports there's there's not like a esoteric sports movie that no one's heard of, but right. I thought maybe you'd make us do something a little off the beaten path, but, but I think it is funny to have whatever crazy thing is Nathan's silent movie and Ben's Japanese, Japanese movie sandwiched between <laughs> one of the most mainstream popular <laughs> movies, movies of, all of all time. time. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I just sort of grew up with the princess bride. There's never a time of it not really being around. It was came out in 87. I was three. And so just sort of always there. And I mean, I've, matured in my understanding of it right and so the rous is seem even more exciting now yeah they're much scarier and mm-hmm. more realistic and much <laughs> less like a man walling around a in a costume little person in a dorky costume yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. i love those things <laughs> it it is fun to see sort of how some of those things really did play sincerely for scary moments or whatever as a kid like yeah. it had had something more visceral to them but how light they truly are like there's some things made in the eighties like that that ha- evoke the same sorts of feelings, but mm-hmm. they are dark. Right. And they have a real edge. They do right. have a real edge oh, yeah. that yeah. like is aggressive or mean. Any Amblin product generally. Yeah, is it's like gonna that. have stuff like that oh, that yeah. like you yeah. go back and are like, Man, that that was kind of an attack on the kids that saw this movie. But you go back to the Princess Bride and it's it's none of that. It's just mm-hmm. super sweet mm-hmm. and a lot of fun. And so, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's just as a piece of craftsmanship. I just think it's it's about as genius level as it gets. The, like, there's so many, there's so many jokes packed into so many scenes. Jokes, quotes, memorable lines. I mean, I was just trying. I couldn't come up with a metaphor that wasn't corny. But I was just like, this screenplay is Michael Jordan on a good night. I mean, it's just yeah, like William just Goldman like, could not do anything wrong. He was every, so in the pocket yeah, with this, this as a piece of writing. Every scene has multiple jokes and like in in some of it's like in the acting in the direction it's the look that humperdinck gives to rugen yeah <laughs> you know it's the same yeah. the, the, the gay subtext <laughs> it's like simmering <laughs> the whole, which mean, is always how the villains were in those old like Merrill flynn movies claude rains and basil rathbone would always be kind of gay but this one's making fun of it in yeah. a really great way that like you can't even argue with like, it's just hilarious. I don't know. I just loved it. And, and as a kid, like, even, I mean, I don't, I still don't care how dopey that sword fight is. It's my favorite sword fight in film history. Uh, Montoya versus uh, the Man in Black, the yeah, first one. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's great. I, I, mean, I mean, I've, I, I, I know that what's his face is a truly great Rathbone or whatever. Right. But still. I mean, this is a parody of that sort of thing, but also it's super fun. It's funny how many, well, I guess we'll get to it when we get to it. My my big thoughts, I remember watching this movie as a kid. I remember our family being told, you got to see The Princess Bride. So we had the perfect experience of, we don't even know what this is, but you know, everybody says we have to rent it. So we got the VHS and we watched it and didn't really know what it was. And it, it sneaks up on you. It's so wonderful how the movie works because you start in the kid's bedroom and you're like, what is this? And then you get that really dopey love story and you kind of start to, as a kid, have the same reaction that Fred Savage is having. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they puncture it perfectly with Fred Savage. Wait, 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 is this a kissing book? And I remember my dad, <laughs> Belly, there's, I, there's a few movies that I remember. I think everybody, if their dad was around at all, they can probably think of the times when their dad really belly laughed. And I remember him belly laughing at Billy Crystal for better or worse. We'll get to that. But also... Fred Savage stopping the kissing like the first time Fred said, and then and then when Grandpa says it was a very emotional time for Buttercup, <laughs> <laughs> and the kid says oh please or something. <laughs> Fred Savage is kind of amazing in this movie. He's, he's, he's fantastic. Great. He's fantastic. But watching it again, I, the thing that I can most compare it to is the old Batman uh, Adam West thing because when I was a kid, 
that just played a hundred percent sincere as an exciting Batman story to me. Mm-hmm. And and watching it now, it's like such such a perfect parody and so silly and so like sarcastic. I've actually never gone back to it since I was a kid, like staying the night at my grandparents watching it on Nick at Night. So it it just plays. I can like remember th- scenes and I in in things and think, oh yeah. Those can't be fun, but I've mm. never actually gone back to it to experience it that way. If you do, you'll just, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously silly. And I would say in a way that Princess Bride isn't, it kind of, you go back to it and you're like, oh, these guys actually hated Batman. <laughs> like, right. Uh, whereas the Princess Bride has, I th- better than anything I can name, I, I don't want to be hyperbolic because, you know, but it's like, they really love this genre. They really love adventure stories. They really love fairy tales. and it's so silly. And in certain places, it's so silly. Like he's going to throw the sword up and then he's going to like walk over and grab the sword. It's just going to dangle. Do three flips. Yeah. <laughs> three spins. Like, like it's flip. so, so like over the top, just straight up parody. And it only cr- crosses the line, I think, once Miracle Max into too much parody. But it's just amazing how much it still plays sincerely as a kind of fun adventure movie. Even, you know, as an adult, you can see all the, the, what's the word that i want you can see see the strings you mm-hmm. you, you understand that the sword fights a little slower than you remembered and the rous is a little sillier and all the stuff but but it still plays pretty well mm-hmm. it's still exciting you still want ink. it's it's very well choreographed yeah and those sword it's fights solid. are great and the advent the cliffs of insanity is a great conceit and the screaming eels and <laughs> <laughs> the screaming eels <laughs> But there's some stuff that's so funny that I just never even realized was funny. Like, I just thought Humperdinck was a villain as a kid. And watching him again, I think he got some of the biggest laughs. Oh, just, yeah. Oh, he's um, so funny. <laughs> Perhaps you will not find her common now. <laughs> just some, some of those readings. Just the deliveries and looks, yeah. And, and by the way, I'll just say this now while I'm thinking of it. I think that guy's doing James Mason. I think I think he's doing oh, James Mason. Oh yeah, he's he sounds so James Mason. It was in my head because we just watched it, North that's, by Northwest. That's, oh, yeah. that's perfect. It, it's it's and then the guy's an American actor. He's not. That's not his real accent. But I just think he's trying to. He's doing a, a straight up James Mason because it's very close to how Mason <laughs> delivers that stuff. That's funny, <laughs> but it's perfect. I mean, it just made me think. Like, man, Disney wishes like Tangled, Frozen, things like that. They wish they could strike this balance of. We're kidding the material, but we're also sincerely doing the They're not the willing to do the work. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. Like, that, the amount of work that went into that screenplay, I think on this viewing, is really what, like, and okay, so it was a novel, it was an adaptation, maybe he took 10 years because it was his baby to, you know, really make every line pop. Right. But my goodness, like, it's a stone cold inarguable what was your word uh undeniable undeniable inevitable classic right. because of it and so nobody wants to do that yeah no it's no marvel movies ever going to put that level of work into but a disney animated feature should yes when encanto comes out or frozen or something like that it should because back in like the beauty and the beast days like the early 90s the renaissance i think that they were at least making that promise whether they delivered it on it and i think a handful of times they did but when the new animated Disney thing comes out, it should have that much craftsmanship. And and I think things like Tangled and Frozen do aspire to, we live in a post-Shrek world, so P- we know we P- have to kid Pixar it. Under, Pixar under Steve yeah. Jobs did. Yeah, the, the true mm-hmm. Pixar classics do. And I just watched, I don't remember why, but I think Meredith had it on or something. I just watched Toy Story, the original Toy Story, not too long ago. It was just on. And mm-hmm. I, I think it was a Christmas day. They had it on for the kids, and I sat in there for a while. I take back anything bad i ever said i want to publicly repent of ever doubting the greatness of the original toy story i um, remember it being great but yeah. i haven't gone back it's no, fantastic it's really great. we'll just have to do it cool um Love the, the only thing it suffers for is the fact that it was one of the first the animation sucks cgi relative to now yeah so it it suffers a little bit in the cgi animation department but, but the design um, no everything awesome. it's just an awesome movie well, speaking of awesome movies, The Princess Bride is an awesome movie. Let's go through it. So we start with Fred Sa- Savage versus Grandpa, Dawn of Justice, first scene. And I never noticed this movie took place in Christmas time before. You look out the window, there's Christmas lights. I didn't even notice this time. It's just, I've watched this movie a thousand times. Adds a nice little level of 
it's a cold day. He's home from school. Winter break is just around the corner. Like it, mm-hmm. they should they should have emphasized it two percent more, maybe. But it's a nice little touch that's there if you're watching it. Come in, HD. comes in with his hat and his coat and his scarf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, doesn't take it off until he gets in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Peter Falk is so awesome. I should have mentioned him in my perfect casting. I mean, I've always. I can never get through an episode of Columbo because all the parts without Columbo are so boring and old TV style. But I love I love Peter Falk as Columbo, and anytime he's solving a mystery, I'm really happy. But he's awesome as Grandpa, and Fred Savage is awesome as the kid. And that look that he gives to his mom when he gets his cheek pinched is uh-huh. mm-hmm. yeah, it's perfect. And I, and already you've got so many classic lines. When I was your age, television was called books. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Your vote of confidence is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess when I said Jewish, uh, yeah, there's some Jewish sensibility in this Peter Falk character. I'm just going <laughs> to go out on a limb there. So I don't know. Any, anything else you guys want to say about this fantastic wraparound story? No, I think about it all the time. Every time I am looking for something on my my person, mm-hmm. I think, all right, all right, all right, Where's, all right. Every time that huh. character goes through, he's looking for his glasses or something like that, right? Or no, he's getting up to go and he's just like checking himself. Do I have everything? I yeah. Gotta, and now I'm going to get my hat. Every time that pops into my head. Oh, it's perfect. It's weird watching a movie as an adult that you loved as a kid because it feels so much shorter. Like, it's weird to me that we only spend like three minutes in the bedroom at the beginning because it always felt like such a, like, it felt like you were easing into the fairy tale stuff. When you watch it as a kid, you watch it now, and it's like it races. This this whole movie moves fast. It's not a flaw or anything, but it's just interesting how perception time, changes. Yeah, time and perception mm-hmm. changes. You grow older. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, your vote of confidence is overwhelming. That line, as I've said before, comes into my mind once a week uh, at least because somebody's vote of confidence is overwhelming, and you just can't express that thought better than to say your vote of confidence is overwhelming and then we go into the first of our flashbacks and we have speaking of other perfect things the score kicks in yes the do 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 but let's talk about that because mm. uh i like the themes oh uh, you're gonna contradict me well uh, why don't you make the argument and i'll see whether i want to make the counter argument or not <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't i will want to we'll see uh, all right. Good. Well, hey, I think it's perfect. I think it's perfect because it sticks in your head and you can sing it. I think it's perfect because it sets the out of the gate the right over sentimental tone that uh, gets the ick mm-hmm. reaction. Mm-hmm. It doesn't come on that heavy ever again, except maybe a little bit at the end. Yeah. Well, there's a full on like song ballad version of it in the in the, in credits, the credits. Yes, <laughs> with some really corny lyrics. Yeah, but I think that Wesley and Buttercup's love theme is just pretty great, sort of like stick with you, live with you, iconic kind of kind of music. Read it back into other things, influence other things downstream, and then everything else is just sort of uh, great classic adventure riffs. Yeah, it's with n- the trumpets and the the synth trumpets. I like I like the opening theme a lot. I think you're right. It really works and pulls you in. But I can't stand the rest of the music because the synth just pulls me out of the movie every time. It's like, this is a cheesy synth score and it feels too sideways to the material to me. I just want something. I wanted like an orchestra. Even if the orchestra is going to be winking at heroic themes, I wouldn't care. But to me, it makes the movie feel, it, it just feels like a cheap element. It, it, doesn't... it never had before this viewing. And like I said, this might have been the first time I saw it as an adult all the way through. But yeah, I had kind of mm-hmm. the same reaction. Like, like just redo huh. this score with an orchestra. Yeah. But yeah. but have Humperdinck up there making his speech and then to hear like synth horns. Dun, da, da, da. Yeah. It just plays a little, it does, I'm with Ben, it just plays a little too sideways. And I want something more aggressively orchestral for the Forest of Despair or whatever, you know, for, for some of the adventure stuff. Yeah. yeah. It detracts maybe from the final duel with Count Rugen. I, yeah, I just feel like if you, if you did that, it would... It wouldn't take away from the from the winking aspect of the movie at all. I think it would add to the production value in such a way that this really would feel like the era of Wizard to Oz or some, something like that. Wizard to Oz. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Wizard I don't know. It might make it feel too heavy. Yeah. As you're talking, Jake, I can't help but think 
that score got me through like 40 viewings of this movie where I yeah. loved it. So maybe my analytical brain should just shut up and my brain that always accepted it before should just say, hey. You've accepted this for 40,000 times. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think that's a compelling argument. I think it's great. It's, a, it's part of a... I think if it was too heavy, if it was too orchestral, if it was too anything more than it is, it wouldn't feel like the light, fun, kids' joyride that you can laugh at as an adult. I that think... It, that it does. I, I mean, Disney and Pixar pulled it off, and their sco- Toy Story has a very light orchestral Randy Newman kind of a score. I just, I think it could be It uses off. a pop song. Yeah, I know. I know. But there's something about just the synth, the synth of it all that, that, that brings it down for me. I don't like when orchestras pretend to, or when synth pretends, like I love a synth score, like a Stranger Things, as everybody would think of now, like a sure. John Carpenter Blade score. Blade Runner, blah, blah, Blade Runner, yeah. yeah. Sure. If it's just like... Even, it, even Chariots of Fire, actually, I accept. I, yeah, you have to. It's undeniable. Dun, Chariots dun, of dun, Fire. Dun, um, dun, 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 <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> Even Chariots of Fire, though, I'm kind of like, uh-huh. could we just get an orchestra to play this? <laughs> well, to be fair, I haven't seen that one. Maybe as It's great. I mean, it's Vangelis. It's undeniable. It's undeniable. But but I generally don't like it when a synth pretends to be an orchestra, which is what you have in Princess Bride. So, but but I think Jake's argument is also undeniable. It's part of a mosaic that I've loved and loved and loved my whole life. So. I haven't seen it since I was a kid, and I don't know. So, I stand by it. I stand by my synth, synth criticism. All right. All your right. synthesis. My your... synthesis. Yep. Yep. <sighs> well, why can't you be more synth... synth, synth, synth pathetic? Wow. <laughs> exactly. I'm very synth pathetic. Wow. This podcast is like William <laughs> Goldman's stream screenplay. <laughs> it's full of gem after gem after well let's talk about that opening scene so we have the undeniable score and i think we all agree that the actual wesley and buttercup theme as used in the movie is pretty good oh yeah me, yeah, me and better more complaining about the adventure music uh, yes think. correct man i never noticed what a big ask this was as a kid like yeah you're gonna have fred savage puncture it but you also have to tell a completely sincere love story that hits and that sets the emotional rules for this couple and the whole love story is too of the most attractive people in the world simmered for a while and then fell in love and that's it. And we don't even know. I mean, I and guess it was true love and it was true love. And that means something special in this story. Right. <laughs> but, but As they have it does in life. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, it makes Not you just any kiss. Yeah. You just imagine the wrong two people playing this, these parts and none of this would work. It would fall apart mm-hmm. right there. You need two people that you just like, and you need her to be able to play the right kind of haughty and him to be able to play the right kind of faux submissive slash I really know I've got you, babe. Like that stuff's really hard to do, actually. It's really easy to take for granted. It doesn't look like they're doing anything all that exciting. It's the, the two most thankless parts compared to all the other colorful parts. But if they don't nail this boring part at the beginning. It, 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 it all hinges on can he actually get that pot down for her? Yeah. <laughs> And what's she going to look like when he does? And what's he going to look like when he does? And they pull it off really well. And not to be a Christian crank, but the reason that you listen to this podcast is because we're Christian cranks. And if we're able to actually build a little love story on actual realities between men and women, which you couldn't do, which is why something like Frozen can't operate with this kind of shorthand because they have to subvert sexual dynamics whereas this movie just very quickly evokes them mm-hmm. and even in its silly fairy tale way it's pretty potent and they're they're both just very good at it and then we have the first big laugh of the movie for my dad at least which is when fred savage punctures it with wait 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 is this a kissing book and then i just want to repeat it again because it might be my favorite line from the movie it's so stupid but uh, the fact that this novel actually includes the sentence it was a very emotional time for Buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> and the way Peter Falk throws it off, it was a very emotional time for Buttercup. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty great. And then Fred Savage, I don't believe this. <laughs> 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 like, I guarantee you, William Goldman's novel does not contain the sentence, it was a very emotional time for Buttercup, but he knew well enough to put an intentionally stupid line in there <laughs> so that we could feel a little bit of Fred Savage's disgust. 
Murdered by Pirates is good. Murdered by Pirates is good. Oh, man. Yeah, it's so great. It's so great. But yeah, but then we go to the king's big announcement, Humperdinck's big announcement. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> you will not find her common now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. Besides, I just found every everything with Humperdinck was my favorite part of this movie. Now, yeah. like he's he's so stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> the guy's giving such a great. He's, uh, yeah, yeah, he's he's the best. Chris Sarandon, Susan's husband, and where she gets her name from. She's Susan somebody else, but she married Chris and became Susan Sarandon. So he bequeathed the great <laughs> Susan Sarandon to us. <sighs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, what else have we seen him in ever? I didn't know. His, I thought his name was Chris. Uh, it's Chris Sarandon. Christopher Chris. Guest is Count Rugen. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. I so just confused them in my brain. Yeah. I know we've seen him else in something else. He's okay. one of those guys that pops up in things. Hmm. Most well known for The Princess Bride, doing the voice of Jack Skellington in The Night Bear Before Christmas. Oh, he has a great voice. Apparently, he plays the gay lover in Dog Day Afternoon, which is a movie I've seen, but I don't remember him. He would I know of very, that movie. very young in that. He was, he's known for Fright Night and Child's Play. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure. He mm. seems like the kind of guy that probably pops up on TV, and if I took the time to go through his... Well, I remember... I don't like Night Movie for Christmas, but... I like Jack Skellington. Yeah, he does yeah. a great he does a great job. Yeah. Although of course Danny Elfman is singing Jack Skellington's part and that's yeah. maybe 60% of Jack Skellington's performance. Yeah, not a lot popping out at me on this guy's IMD, IMDb. He did voices for Tailspin. Just feels like a journey hmm. a good journeyman huh, actor. Right. But man, he's fantastic as Humperdinck. He's so funny. And I never noticed it as a kid. Like the, mm-hmm. that was a complete surprise to me that Humperdinck was anything but just the square kind of boring villain that wasn't as interesting <laughs> as count rugen but he was my favorite part of the movie this time i think well that's not true but because we're about to get to the actual best part of the movie which is our three kidnappers trio. Mm-hmm. and what's his face rex the dinosaur wally sean wallace sean is wallace sean. so great i don't know just want this podcast to be us talking about each scene and saying so great but what else do you say when you're talking about the princess bride man those guys are so fantastic together. All three of mm-hmm. them. Three three really weird, different energies. We've got Andre the Giant, who can't really Rupert, act, but is just really sweet. Three poor lost circus performers. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Wallace Shawn says to this day that he didn't really understand it. It's not really his style of comedy. Reiner had to talk him through everything. Somehow he got it in his head that they had, they had gone to DeVito first. And so he was afraid of being replaced by DeVito the whole time. And so he didn't really have a good time making it. But to this day, of course, somebody comes up to him every day and says inconceivable uh-huh. or says land war in Asia or yeah. you know, it's going to be the thing that he's most remembered for, which, which he doesn't. He's not one of those jerks resents that, that resents it. He's happy, but it's just like he did a thing. He barely knew what he was doing. And now it's absolutely uh-huh. iconic. Uh-huh. And he gets cast like he he's always doing little voices in Pixar where he basically plays a riff now on uh-huh. like, yeah, he's going to be the annoying boss in the Incredibles or, mm-hmm. you know, any anytime you need or, or Rex the dinosaur, even anytime you need like a nervous little talkative character, you're going to get him, man. Oh, my dad's I, I'll, I'll catalog as many of my dad's belly laughs as I can, because I think they're interesting. My dad loved friendless, brainless. Helpless, hopeless. Do you want me to send you back to where you were? Unemployed, Unemployed in <laughs> Greenland. <laughs> that's one of my favorites. I thought I kept thinking about throwing it out there. <laughs> I, I don't even know why that's funny, but it is funny. Like it the is, fact yeah. that unemployed in Greenland. Unemployed in Greenland. Like what? It's just the specificity just the detail, of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Comedy is all about specificity, and so I don't know. Like yeah. it's for, for some reason it's much worse. Not he wasn't just unemployed. <laughs> He was unemployed in Greenland. <laughs> yeah. is, that's that's a very William Goldman-y kind of line. I mean, this movie is all very William Goldman-y, but that's that kind of funny specificity is very William Goldman-y. And the book is full of little things like that. Let's see. What else, uh, what else is there to say? So we've got the screaming eels. I love that. He grabs her by the neck and she just passes out. Mm-hmm. Every, every little... Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, certainly as a kid, this movie... The first time we watched it crept up on me by the time of the Screaming Eels. I mean, it's awesome how well they track Fred Savage because he actually does track pretty well. 
Mm-hmm. But by the time of the screaming eels, like you care and you're into it and you're having fun. And mm-hmm. then... You look nervous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she doesn't get eaten by the eels. <laughs> At this time. The man in black starts pursuing them. We have another one of my favorite Wallace Shawn lines. <laughs> Move the thing and the other thing. Gaining on us. <laughs> <laughs> Inconceivable. I would say as far as Rob Reiner actually evoking a real fantasy atmosphere, mm-hmm. the Cliffs of Insanity are the thing that like it's just a matte painting and you can right. tell but it's a right. it's a cool matte painting yeah and you actually feel the scariness of the cliffs and yeah he does a great job with that yeah yeah it's all i love watching them climb it right uh-huh which by the way andre the giant had had all from his wrestling career had these terrible terrible back problems hmm. and so he could not lift anything like they hired a real giant and they had to use cables for when robin wright fell and falls into his arms at the end when she does the graceful fluttering thing and mm-hmm. she, he's hold, he's holding her and, and when they're going up andre the giant could not bear any weight which he was ashamed of but it's just kind of funny like they they paid good money for the most famous giant in the world and they they had to hire stunt giants to do any kind of giant stuff that is really weird but they all talk about how sweet andre the giant was everybody loved that man yeah people just loved there's him. a documentary i've always wanted to watch i think it might be it might be one of those espn 30 for 30s or something like that but i think it was a bill simmons thing yeah but i mean i've seen enough clips of it and heard enough anecdotes and stories that pretty cool guy it sounds like he was just a really sweet guy who handled his not it's not exactly a disability but the fact that he became a giant he just he he parlayed it into something really well it's they, they say he like wanted to see the world and he figured, you know what? The best way that I can do that it is It kind of to- was a disability. It kind of was a condition that it he knew was going to kill him. You and, know. and it did, And right? it did, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but it sounds like he just handled it cheerfully, gracefully, said, what's the best way that I can make the most of it? And it turned out by being a wrestler, of all mm-hmm. things. Hmm. And so he went and took his lumps as a wrestler, made his money for his family, got to see the world like he wanted to do, and... Really loved being a part of The Princess Bride. If you watch any of the retrospectives or listen to anybody talk or read Carrie Ilway's book or anything like that, everybody just talks about what a sweet guy and how much they loved Andre the Giant and how much they miss him. And <laughs> Yeah, so I think... And he just... It, it comes through in the movie, like how much everybody likes him and how sweet he is. It's mm-hmm. like it's one of the, the secret charms of the movie. But we get to the cliffs inconceivable you keep on using that word i don't think it means what you think it means obviously probably one of the top 10 lines that people like to Mm -hmm. quote rhyming and i mean it oh yeah we skipped over yeah anybody want a peanut Mm -hmm. which i don't think is from the novel you can imagine it would be weird if you wrote that into a novel but it works really well to establish those two guys so perfect the chemistry between the different characters that need to have chemistry is the kind of thing that i guess you can just give it to rob reiner he knows how to cast people that seem to really like each other and work well together Mm -hmm. yeah we get to the big duel well we get to the climb up the cliffs and the that does put a damper on our relationship is Mm -hmm. definitely my favorite line in the movie and one that i like to use as often as possible and along with your vote of confidence is overwhelming it's it occurs to me to say it many 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 times and i've said it to many people in many circumstances (laughs) i love that line it's just the perfect non-funny like it's it's the kind of thing that errol flynn would say and carrie always plays a very straight good errol flynn type and it's great and then i don't know what do you guys want to say about the duel and the everything you seem a decent fellow i hate to kill you you seem a decent fellow i hate to die (laughs) (laughs) i i i always loved actually the lead up to it the you do not suppose you could hurry things up a bit you could throw down a rope Mm. or a tree branch or something (laughs) I've known too many Spaniards. Uh-huh. Yes, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I swear on the sword of my father, Domingo Montoya, you will reach the top alive. Tell me the oh, rope. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, all that stuff. And then he gets to the top and uh, he asks about the sword and then Montoya just hands the sword over to... Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. Honor <laughs> among... They, they have that sort of, yeah... Honor, higher killers. <laughs> yeah, honor among assassins yeah. kind of... I think if you... I don't know why or that I'm prepared to make a larger point with this, although I think you probably could make one, but I think little boys... Love that stuff. I, th- yeah. I think watching the movie, one of the things you really respond to is these two guys are going to be super friendly to each other and mm-hmm. respect each other and yeah. let each other no, pick no, up take their your swords. Time. Yeah. Uh, catch your breath. Mm-hmm. Again, thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Dumps all the rocks out of uh-huh. his boots. Yeah, and then chosen. I've never seen its equal. And 
Yeah. All of that. All the way down to kill me quickly. Kill me quickly. I just as soon destroy a stained glass window. Yeah, as an artist such as yourself. Yeah. However, since I can't have you following me, I wonder how much we could we could probably just do. We this could movie. do the whole movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guarantee it. Yeah, between the three of us, mm-hmm. uh, one of us might stumble over something, but we'd all we'll be, ca- we'd we could, catch each other. We could piece it together. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, probably so. Just like Using we could do with Bible. defense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, those defenses are all real. Yeah. William Goldman did a lot of research. And the guy that was the sword master, I forget what his name was, the, the guy that trained them. He's he, famous. He's famous, and he had worked with Errol Flynn. He had worked with all the greats, with Rathbone, with all the... He had, he had choreographed many of the famous duels. And Goldman's script, which when I was a young cinephile, I think I read, because I remember stage directions, it actually says... The greatest sword fight ever in cinema now commences, or something like that. <laughs> Goldman mm-hmm. likes to have fun, even in his in, in, in his, his notes. In his notes, uh, I know that Rob Reiner wanted to make the greatest sword fight ever. I read an article a couple of times about him insisting that it become awesome. Yeah, and like, I think I'm not I'm not a trained fencing guy at all, but I think in terms of them actually doing the moves that they're talking very about, much like precision. Yeah. Yeah, like this is a sword fighting movie that sword fighters would actually watch and and like. This this article claimed that fencing masters show it to their students. Yeah, so. I believe it. Yeah. yeah, and by the standards of today, I mean, I, I guess it feels a little slow and a little something, but but it's still like but if it's, you, it's none of it. Like I don't know, it's not a lightsaber battle where everybody's spinning around like an idiot. You know, it's no, it makes fun actual, of those kind of things. A it's couple an times. actual sword fight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It it has more the feeling. I mean, I like sword fights a lot, mm-hmm. and I like samurai movies. Samurai movies. I don't know what to say. There's there's a verite kind of thing going on because often these guys. Well, we'll talk about it in Yojimbo. Right. They're trained in fencing, and their fights are not. They're generally not flashy. Like they're just fast. But you have the sense like this is actual. Or this is derivative of actual stuff, right? Like action, the yeah. way you actually would use the sword. Right. And this fight, especially watching it as an adult, it has that feeling, like uh, the same. Like the same, I buy it. The yeah. same is actually true of Count Regan. I took I took a fencing class my senior year of college because I had all the credits I needed to graduate, mm-hmm. or I needed maybe some elective credit or something like that. So I took a fencing. But your teacher class. had challenged you to a duel that you would, if you couldn't defeat him, you wouldn't be able to graduate. That's right. And so I had, yeah, so I took fencing in order to prepare for it and I won the duel and I graduated yeah. and here we are and he's dead. Yeah. So, so you took a <laughs> Jake fencing changed, class. Jake changed his so, name so, from, <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> My very name. limited knowledge of fencing from one semester of fencing class. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, I I recognize just the very, and it's anything that you would actually know if you'd, even in taking just a basic martial arts class, like about pairing a, an mm-hmm. attack or something like that. It's really subtle movements. It's not, it's about redirection. It's not about mm-hmm. slapping something away. Right. And, They're not just hacking at each other like right. like the worst of what a Star Wars fight can be. Mm-hmm. It, it's a very subtle redirect and move into an attack into your counter parry and thrust. Mm-hmm. And movies that movie's great at that. Yeah, the way that they use the terrain. The fact that both actors are able to convincingly fight left handed and yeah. then and then swap and go even faster and more furious and awesome right handed. I mean, yeah. that took training and work and they they really do a great job. Yes, it is one of the top ten movie sword fights for sure. And when it decides to puncture it with a little parody, with the triple flip, and with the part where he throws the sword up and then hops a rock, and the sword <laughs> <laughs> Catch, come, comes straight down comes into down. his hand. Yeah, it's perfect. It's funny to me that that didn't puncture the reality to me as a kid because both of those things are so silly. But <laughs> you're just into it at that point. You're yeah. watching a really exciting yeah. action scene, and yeah, you even just don't care. even the <laughs> triple uh, spin and flip is to a kid i think plays as a i am much more than you thought i was kind of like yeah it's part of the braggadocio of an actual fight like yeah. ha, yep. like it's true not only am i not left-handed but whatever you just did i do better you better be afraid because i'm going to destroy you mm-hmm. like, <laughs> that's how it plays yeah no it's great and I th- maybe I already said this, but maybe I said it in a muddled way. Wh- when they say the words like "you must expect me to use Pirelli's defense" and stuff, that is all yeah. accurate. Goldman yep. researched all that stuff, and apparently, you're seeing them do those things, whatever they are, as they talk about them. So it's, mm-hmm. it's not just gobbledygook, which is which is really fun. My my favorite part of the choreography is the moment where uh, they pause and pose. 
Uh, which, by the way, we haven't spent enough time at this point in the story saying how great Mandy Patinkin is in this movie. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, he's maybe my favorite. It's maybe easy not to talk about because it's the thing that strikes you the most when you're a kid. You love yeah. that character. You love the, his little speech. You love his catchphrase, all that stuff. And like, we've all absorbed that so much. It's the, what, what are you going to say about it now as adults? But man, he brings such sweetness to that role. And he's so good with Fezzik and mm-hmm. the conversation between him and the man in the black is like, as a kid, and now you really feel the emotions of like the evil of Count Rugen. And mm-hmm. It all actually works, and you're rooting for him to get his revenge. And he manages to play kind of a stupid, helpless character who would never get it get anywhere without the Man in Black, but play him really sympathetically and heroically. And mm-hmm. and then he gets the most emotionally cathartic line of the movie. Yes, yes, the one that we can't say on this <laughs> <That's right. laughs> family podcast, and the one that I think was fast forwarded. At least a couple times in my childhood. Never fast forwarded in my house. Yeah. Just celebrated. Well. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I never actually said this. So the reason <laughs> the reason that Jake was being vindictive when he made me do The Princess Bride, the reason he's heard me hate on The Princess Bride a number of times is because growing up in a Christian house and going to Christian youth groups and Christian slumber parties and things like this, The Princess Bride was just so annoyingly ubiquitous we could not watch anything else be, you know it's just it was the movie that was clean enough but also fun enough that you could show it especially to teenagers and nobody would hate it but i also wouldn't have anything bad besides one blasphemy and one naughty word and so i just had to watch this movie so 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 many times for some reason i didn't i don't know why and I've talked to many people who've had that experience who's just like, oh, yeah, The Princess Bride. That was like our youth group staple. Like twice a year, we'd end up watching it. Absent minded uh, professor as a little kid. Like the old one with, uh, what's his face? Not, not Flubber, not. Double indemnity. Double indemnity dude. guy, yeah. What's, what's his name? What's his name? He's, he's Fred McMurray. Fred McMurray, yeah. For, well, I remember that at like every single camp that would be, that would be played that That's I ever funny. went to. Grandparents sent me to a lot of summer camps going, mm-hmm. growing up. Camp, youth group too. But not Princess Bride. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you have that movie? Was there that movie in your childhood that was just everywhere, Jake? I mean, The Princess Bride was everywhere, but I wasn't in church right. circles. It was just one of any number of movies we all just thought was hilarious. And like it was like that or Money Python and the Holy Grail or right. a couple other movies like that. Or just any number of, like, as it got to be, like, I mean... Whatever Adam Sandler SNL type yes, those Chris, are Chris Farley movie right. was was out. That was just what we what we watched. But Princess Bride was always a steady go to. It was more. I actually associate the Princess Bride more with like after prom or like after after a dance or something like that. So it's like the kind of thing that you would have a party. You know, maybe it'd be a sleepover at somebody's house, but there'd be girls there, mm-hmm. and so you wanted a movie that was funny and fun and light, but also one that would play with the girls. And so Princess Bride was more. That's like, interesting. For me, that was The Wedding Singer, the Adam Sandler movie. That movie was always any mixed sex where we had enough control over it and there weren't annoying parents. So we weren't going to do The Princess Bride. It would be always, always, always. We just never had. Singer. I don't think we ever had the idea that The Princess Bride was imposed on us by authority figures who wanted to keep us from seeing forbidden things. It was right. more like. No, nah, this is just a fun, funny movie that we all like. Yeah. And we, so we want to watch it. Yeah, which is good and fine and hmm. go Jake's childhood. But yeah. So if I've ever denigrated The Princess Bride, it's not The Princess Bride's fault. I've just denigrated the experience that I had with The Princess Bride, if it being the one thing that all Christian parents could agree on. I mean, even Star Wars in my circle, it was like some people wouldn't let their kids watch it because of the Buddhism or because of this or that. Or huh. so it was like, it was pretty hard to find something that everybody agreed to and the princess bride really i mean there was obviously like lame animated kids movies that we were all all thought we were past but then there was the princess bride it was the one movie that had like action and a couple bad words and stuff that but it but everybody agreed that it was kosher so all right we're moving through this story man first of the three challenges very fairy tale conceit by the way that uh, wesley has to defeat Three escalating challenges, first a sort a duel and then a But they're more like de escalating yeah, challenges. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the yeah, that's the golden touch. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really long extended sword fight. 
A really short wrestling match. <laughs> <With> a giant, <laughs> yeah. And an even shorter battle of wits. But first we get to Andre. My way is not very sportsmanlike. I don't do it in Andre, but uh, <laughs> I love that line. Yeah. Um, I didn't have to miss. Yeah. <laughs> you, you put down your rock and I put down my sword and we fight each other like civilized people. <laughs> we kill each other. Like, yeah, I could uh, kill you right now. Yeah. It's not my fault being bigger and stronger. Always being the biggest and the strongest. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even exercise. <laughs> Sleep well and dream of large women. Yes, that's... <laughs> That's another belly laugh for dad. Sleep well and dream of large women. He <laughs> loved that. And then I think if you're not locked into this movie already, how can you fail to lock in when he has the battle of wits? What a perfect piece of writing. I, I love Humperdinck. <laughs> Odorless, tasteless. First thing Humperdinck does is <laughs> grab it, smell it. I came powder. I bet my life on it. <laughs> All those dopey cutbacks to Humperdinck where he so says something stupid and pretentious and then hop on his horse. And... He's like, he's like in... <laughs> he's and in unless his, he's alive, I'll be very much put out. <laughs> I'll be very much put out. That is, I will, I will say that is where the crappy score probably contributes to the comedy is you know, uh -huh. having bad and synth it's trumpets. Bump, bump, bump. <laughs> yeah, it's true. The fact that Humperdinck is just in his own movie where he's the hero of that movie and he really believes in it. And having Rugen kind of slyly, dryly r lurking in the background only helps. And yeah, it's just a lot of fun. But yes, the the battle of wits. Ever hear of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle? <laughs> yes. Moron. Yeah, I don't know what to say about this. This is, this is the scene I feel like we should have something to say about because to me it's the iconic best scene of the movie probably. I mean, every, there's so many scenes that you could say are the best. The sword fight, the first sword fight's the best scene of the movie, but the Wallace Shawn showdown is so great, but... I guess the one the one maybe thing I'll say about it is there's so many references in that scene that go over kids' heads and it just does not matter. And I think I wish more kids' movies were like that. You understand the poetry of what land war in Asia means, even if you don't get the joke, if you're mm -hmm. not up on your world politics enough or, or never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the <laughs> line. You, you know what's going on. You know who these two archetypes are. You know what's happening. You You, you get it. And so... It can be filled with all these jokes that are just for parents that fly past kids' heads, and and it's great. And that was the kind of the most fun one to discover as a as an adult, and suddenly realize I knew why you'd never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line, and why you'd never start a land war in Asia, and why those were the two the classic <laughs> blunders. <laughs> 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 you fell victim to one of the classic blunders. The first, the most, is. The most famous of which is <laughs> never get involved in a land war in Asia. But only slightly less, less well known is this. <laughs> oh, man, never going against a Sicilian when death is on the line. And then the laugh. The laugh and the drop the dead. Drop dead is uh, so well executed. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and I, what, a, what a surprise as a kid. I poisoned both of the cups. Yes. <laughs> I always felt bad yeah. about that. I felt like that wasn't playing fair. I think that actually uh, lends credence to Jake's idea that Wesley actually is a cold-blooded killer <laughs> who's been killing people on those ships. Well, I think as a kid, it doesn't play fair. It feels like cheating. And as an adult, though, it's like this is the perfect battle of the wits thing to do. It is perfect. And it plays fair insofar as he's the one bad guy that deserves to get it. Yeah. And... and mm -hmm. He's got a knife to her neck. He's he, been cruel he to his underlings. Her. The whole point was... For him to kill her and leave her on the doorstep of Gilder. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And it's a battle of the wits. He should be able to step back and say, you poisoned them both. Yeah, he basically deserves what's coming to him. Yeah. 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 I mean, even just the, the fact that he's been mean to Andre the giant, giant, in movie terms, that means he deserves it. Emotionally, we don't like him because he's mean to people that we like, and so we don't care that... Wesley dispatches him fairly cold-bloodedly. It makes emotional sense. But but I was always a softy with stuff like that. For whatever reason, my sympathy always goes out to the villain. Always has, probably always will. I don't know why, but that's the way I was built, even as a kid. So I felt bad for poor Wally Sean. Got tricked into poisoning himself. Yeah. Well, it leads up to one of the biggest laughs that you get as a kid, I think, and that still plays as an adult, which is Buttercup throwing herself down the hill. <laughs> That's so stupid. It's so <laughs> that's, stupid. That's one of the places. So Rob <laughs> Rob Reiner said to the to said to the, his actors, "I want you to hold your cards, and I never want you to show them." And that's how we're going to play this movie. Like you're going to have the cards, but 
you you may never show your cards like you can maybe tip your hand a little bit sometimes and some of you can tip your hands more than others but we're never just going to put our cards on the table and that's obviously a great direction and that's the way the movie goes but there are places miracle max being the most egregious but second only to this <laughs> buttercup throwing herself down that <laughs> steep hill both of them don't know how to roll down a hill <laughs> like really bad yeah, at and it. then we cut to obvious stuntmen doing these <laughs> tremendous rolls so good it's it's, it's i love it's, it it's fantastic well i think the whole scene leading up to that is a good scene to study how good these two people are at playing relatively thankless roles like yeah they bring a lot of energy. I think she in particular, she has a role that could be so unlikable and so thankless. She's just the beautiful princess. She's relatively passive. She doesn't get to do much in the story, which I think is fine. But you have to find the right person with the right energy and the right attitude to play that kind of thing. I died that day. I died that day. You can die too for all I care. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> oh, she... Oh, sweet Wesley, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> she actually makes all that stuff work. And yeah. I think... She's 19 years old at the time. She's an American. She really? Yeah. I, I, think that's what, I think that's one of the things that makes it work is her reaction shots. Like, if you watch what she's doing when she doesn't have to make those silly declamatory princess lines, she's just a 19-year-old girl, and she's reacting to it pretty realistically. And so, and, and with a kind of real American girl sensibility, Wesley mm -hmm. says lines about the forest, you know, the forest of despair, whatever it is, the... What's it called? The fire swamp. The fire swamp. And she kind of gives him this look like, what? So in in same way we talk about Jimmy Stewart has all his shtick, but then when he's just reacting, he's the most natural actor in the world. Robin Wright, I think, if you watch what she's doing when the camera's on someone else, she's she's giving a performance that really brings Buttercup to life and makes her more than just the stock like Disney princess kind of Snow White mm -hmm. character. And it makes you not resent the fact that She's so passive when her dress is on fire, you know, even as not a feminist, it, you can sometimes watch an old movie and be like, come on, princess, you could pick up a log and go after the R-O-U-S a little harder, which mm -hmm. I, I realize she does. Eventually. Eventually. But, like, but Robin Wright, I think, brings a nice modern sensibility to it. Just filling in the cracks, the, the mortar of the performance. Um, Carrie Elways, on the other hand, just plays straight, like he doesn't show his cards really at all some somewhat at the end when he's been paralyzed or whatever and come back to life he's he's playing a little sillier but for the first two-thirds of this movie he just plays mm -hmm. a straight errol flynn I, I guess there's a little bit of a wink in some of the poses that he strikes right you know, with the <laughs> sword fight and stuff like that but he plays i mean you could just stick him in a real adventure movie and he would just he would just work i mean he has in the same way that errol flynn or somebody like that works mm -hmm. he just he just plays and that's the right that's the right way to do it but it would be so easy for him to be boring and for us to resent them if 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 they were cast wrong if they were cast with boring actor actors like it's as i always say it's it's hard to play the straight man well and they both do it oh here's the other thing that i remember from the book interesting change in the book he actually does slap her and he doesn't in the movie and it's just an interesting little note about adaptation and what works in a book in a book it has a shocking effect but it does not have the shocking effect that it actually would like like if if he actually slaps robin wright in the movie everybody he, feels bad about everybody it. feels bad and you lose sympathy yeah but he threatens the slapper and you feel actually the same thing that you feel in the book mm -hmm. when he does mm -hmm. when it just says he slapped her period so that, those are the kinds of changes that you have to make like you, you can't it's it's not a one-to-one -one sort of thing like you can get the same effect by doing something else and you have to be smart about that and that's a really obvious example because it would be terrible like what kind of an idiot would have robin wright get slapped in in this movie but those are the kinds of things that you have to do and you have to adapt the spirit of the book not the letter of the book that was a warning that was a warning next time my hand flies, flies free, of its own accord flies of its own for where I come from, there are penalties when a woman lies. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I was shocked when I read the book because in the book it's, it just says, he slapped her. Highness, where, there are, in, where I come from, there are penalties when a woman lies. I'm like, oh, well, this is, this, is, this is hardcore. But life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Yeah, that, that's got to be in the that's top. That's one of my favorite lines. That's, that's got to be in the top five. Uh, maybe we should just decide what's in the top five so far. But I want to put the, your vote of confidence is overwhelming. Maybe that's just a personal choice. Life is pain, highness. One. That does put a damper on our relationship. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, hello, my name is Inigo. I, yes, has I, already I, happened. That's, that's number one, mm -hmm. probably. 
Okay, the roll down the hill is stupid. We already talked about that. But as you wish. As you wish, yes. As you <laughs> wish. Oh, my sweet bus. <laughs> <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> it's great. Yeah. As a kid, I remember wondering whether, like, it's so obvious that he's Wesley, even to a kid. It's, it's like, does part of her know and they're just playing this out because they're irritated with each other right now? Like, uh, and I, I don't know whether that was ever the movie's intention, but I remember feeling like I was being played with as a kid. And then as an adult, it's just like, it doesn't really matter that much, but, but it's interesting. He's uh, angry and testing her out. She's angry about everything. Mm-hmm. Well, her sweet Leslie Dot was killed by the Dread Pirate Ro- Roberts. Why wouldn't she be the Dread Pirate Roberts, by the way? Uh, so, I'll never doubt again. I'll never doubt again. Uh, so we got the romance. Fred Savage doesn't mind quite as much, but he still minds a little bit. We skip forward to the fire swamp. And I don't know. What do you guys want to say about this fire swamp? I remember as a kid, I was always, I was genuinely freaked out by the quicksand thing. Mm-hmm. In my mind, that became something much bigger, just like because I, I was just imagining being trapped down there in the quicksand. It's, it's good the way they do it. I mean, the fire swamp's not bad. It's the, yeah. other, it's the other part of the movie that actually feels like as close to as Rob Reiner gets to mm-hmm. what a Lucas or Spielberg would do right. with this material. Right. Everything Rob Reiner does always feels more like a set than Spielberg or Lucas. I mean, that's not really true. But they, they, they would still one up it. I mean, if you compare mm-hmm. Dagobah to the fire swamp, obviously yeah, Dagobah yeah, yeah, wins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the fire swamp comes a little closer it, than yeah. some of the castle stuff does, for example. It, it's it's a pretty fun environment. Yeah. 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 It was scary enough as a little boy. Uh-huh. Yeah, three, four, five, however old I was when I first saw it. Right. It scary enough. But, yeah. I mean, I grew up being terrified of quicksand. Yeah. Which was going to swallow me up. It's the most visceral quicksand scene I can think of off the top I of my head. Think of, I can't think of another one except for in like cartoons and things like that. Indiana mm-hmm. Jones and the old well, professor sucks at life, whatever that movie's called. What is that movie yeah, called? Yeah, but that wasn't a kid one. Indiana Jones and the Fire, and the fire Ants of Doom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is left that strong of an impression. You know, you had to be worried. I remember going to the beach and mm-hmm. going to on vacation in Florida and being like asking and being worried about quicksand. Or my grandparents lived in Arizona. The desert. Is there quicksand in the desert? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's the quicksand's well done. I mean, the ROUSs are obviously the least well done of the three. The fire's fine. But the ROUS actually still works. I mean, even as an adult, it's not like I'm terrified or anything, but I don't think it's clunky. Like, it works as a... You could see it being in A New Hope or something like that mm. and not being that much more well done than it is yeah. there. Sure. It's not that much better than the garbage it'd be, monster. It'd be, or, uh-huh. Yeah, it'd be less... Obviously, a man in a costume. Right. George Lucas would but, cut around it a little bit better and just use his filmmaking skills to hide it. But but it's good. I mean, I like the violence with which it's dispatched. It gets set on fire, and then he stabs it, and you you feel some real visceral, like... You get your score coming in with each stab. Uh, yeah, so uh, Wesley's going to get kidnapped, and... Where men of action lies do not become us. Lies do not become well us. spoken, sir. Yes. This is when Christopher <laughs> Guest gets his chance to shine. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, he's awesome. He, he is so dry. Your right hand. I mean, Christopher Guest holds his, he'll, he'll, he'll his cards so close that even now I'm like, I think he's just playing a real villain. Like the comedy, the comedy is so dry and subtle with the way he does it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Like he's, he basically just plays a straight villain from the era. I do but, remember this is for Buster. Yeah. That's the part where he gets to. <laughs> I just sucked a year of your life away. <laughs> how, many, how does that make you feel? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, if you haven't got your health, you haven't got anything. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Amazing. Uh, so Wesley's going into the pit of despair. We have the corniest joke of the movie yeah. with, the, with the albino. The, albino. Um, the pit of despair. <clears throat> The pit of despair. Uh, I like that kind of joke. Maybe it feels a little out of place in this particular movie, but it wouldn't be out of place in a Chip and Lance skit. And yeah, I mean, this movie really follows the structure, the Campbellian structure. We're going to, this the second act is going to bring us through the fire swamp and then into the part where our hero dies and goes to the belly of the whale. Yeah. The, as the, as the kids, as kids, you really feel the darkness of it. You do feel the darkness of the, 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 the torture machine is so silly now with the water mm-hmm. and the suction cups, but. As a kid, it did feel pretty visceral. Just the idea of life being sucked away by a machine is mm-hmm. kind of like... It's genuinely creepy. Cringy and creepy. And then Fred Savage plays 
plays it perfectly when he's sad and grandpa gets another one of the great lines and maybe the most Jewish line, uh, you know, who says life is fair? Where is that written? And it's great. It's great. I always think of an anecdote of George Lucas. Han Solo said, this is boring in the script of Empire Strikes Back when they were getting chased by bad guys. And George Lucas had them cut the line out because he wouldn't have a your audience avatars have to actually be engaged. They can't say it's boring. Your audience will decide it's boring. Mm -hmm. And I think Fred Savage illustrates that point nicely. Having him be so engaged actually increases our engagement in the movie. (sighs) Tyrone, you know how much I love watching you work, but I've got my country's 500th anniversary to plan, my wedding to arrange, my wife to murder. And and Gilded gilded a frame frame for it. it. I'm swamped. (laughs) (laughs) She really does love you. Which means you might have been happy. That's later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think we're basically there. We got the, is the boo, the old lady, the the dream, the boo, boo. Is that in yeah, this Yeah, that, that's what comes next. So like he dies and then she's going to get married to Humperdinck and Fred Savage is like, this is all wrong. And then boom, turns out to be a dream. And then we go to the castle. And meanwhile, Fezzik is nursing and he go back to hell. Right. The brute squad. You are and, the brute squad. Yeah. So he's like, we're like in the castle now and it's like clear the thieves forest. And then we have that and they already sober him up and start the search because he runs down and tortures him. And that's how they can find that's him. That's how they find him. Yeah. My, my soul made that same cry the night my father died. The yeah. night black makes it now. <laughs> All played, played pretty straight, by the way. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Not a lot of kidding the material in that whole sense. I mean, the torture machine is silly. The, there's a lot of stuff that's underlying silly, but as a kid, especially, it's pretty dark and pretty straight there. And just. And the, the old woman as a kid creeped me out probably the most of anything. Boo. Yeah. Boo. yeah. She's just ugly and horrible. And it's like, yeah. this is a new horrible reality that you. True know. love saved you in the fire swamp. <laughs> this is such a dumb speech. <laughs> <laughs> But. Well, and as a kid, you just accept the rules. Like, if Humperdinck can get her to say I do, then they'll be married and there's nothing she can do about it, even if it's against her will. Like, you don't question. No, the... She never says I do. That, mm-hmm. well, exactly. I'm if you can get the priest to say man and wife. Man and wife. <laughs> um, and the priest. When we get to the priest. Mm-hmm. Just like, why did they think to put that joke in? Who right. would have thought to put the priest with the lisp joke in? <laughs> oh. Well, or with a speech impediment. Yeah. And then they, they milk it for everything. <laughs> so, do you have, do you have the, the wing? wing? <laughs> like they keep, it's such a simple little comedic conceit, but they keep finding ways to <laughs> new words for him to mangle. And it's really funny. And that's Peter Cook, a great British comedian um, from, from the Goonies and influence on Monty Python and one of the greats. But uh, I guess we have to talk about Miracle Max and Valerie before we... I'm going to stand by You're standing, it. standing, for, standing up yeah, for it? I'm, I'm going to stand up for it. That's well, a crowd pleaser. Everybody loves Miracle Max. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. Mm-hmm. To blathe. He clearly said to blathe. Which oh. means you were, which we all know means to lie. So you were, or to bluff. You having a game of cards and yeah. That's... Why don't you just give me a paper cut and pour some nice lemon juice on it? I don't know. It's, I don't know, Ben. How do you feel about Miracle Max? I mean, it made me pretty unhappy. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah, have so, fun storm in the castle. Uh, yeah, I know. I know everyone loves that line, but I was not able to enjoy. It. I mean, part of it is you—you you guys watched it all through your childhood, and there was like a long missing chunk of years where I didn't see it at mm-hmm. all. So I don't have that connective tissue. I feel like I was coming back to it all mm-hmm. for the first time. I, I just again. find myself taking up the position that there is some unnecessary retrospective Billy Crystal hate in the world or in this room. And I just, you know what? Billy Crystal was funny for a reason and people loved him for a reason and threw him in to play a shtick for a reason into random things like Calcifer and... No, it is very popular to hate Billy Crystal. I I admit that. I don't think I hate Billy Crystal. I just think I I was trying to... I was watching it last night and I was like, ah, this isn't funny. It's pulling me out of the movie. I'm with Jake insofar as I want to like it. I, I don't think Billy Crystal's done a good job of tending his legacy. I think he's been too sentimental about it, and people have turned on him for whatever reason. I don't really know why, but we as a society have turned on Billy Crystal. <laughs> and I, I, I would like to not be part of that, because we all liked him, and we shouldn't pretend like we didn't. We shouldn't didn't. pretend like we didn't like him. We shouldn't pretend like everybody saw City Slickers and City Slickers too, because Billy Crystal was a thing, and they liked it. 
Right. City Slickers probably still works. When Harry Met Sally, I've watched within the last few years, obviously it has some naughty stuff, but it works. Billy Crystal's a good actor and a good comedian, and his old Saturday Night Live stuff is pretty funny. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with Billy Crystal, but I'm with Ben in that I just think... I, I get why people love it as a scene, but it does take me out of the movie. It's just like, we're going to show all our cards. Like, yeah, we're just doing a goofy comedy. I mean, and maybe it, it always worked for me as a kid. As uh, a kid, it probably would. Probably did. As a kid, you didn't even know it was Billy Crystal or what was going on. Right. I mean, I knew yeah. because my dad was like, oh, Billy Crystal. And then more belly laughs. Or maybe my dad didn't realize it was Billy Crystal until he came up in the credits with his, where they show all the people at the end. And then it was a delightful surprise. But I mean, I remember it being everybody's favorite scene as a kid. I remember I'm not a witch or wife being a huge laugh line. Yeah. As an adult, maybe with the wrong sensibility. Maybe, maybe I, maybe my adult cynical, more artistically savvy brain is, is wrong not to, it's like the same reason you wouldn't like the genie in Aladdin or you wouldn't like any number of popular things that aren't, don't really gel well with their given movie. But. Eh, I don't feel bad about not liking it. I like the movie. <laughs> I just feel like eh, I don't like it. That's good. We have a hater, and we have a hater, a lover, and yeah. a, uh, Billy Crystal's good at what he. It's a good scene in and of itself. I will. I, I do not hate it taken as itself. I think a lot of the lines are funny, and Crystal's improvs are funny, and the wife character Carol Kane's funny, and it did take me out of the movie and. It's also impossible to go back and unremember those punchlines. Like, if I didn't know the punchline so well, would I be so busy laughing that I wouldn't notice how much I was taken out of the movie as an adult? Maybe. But I have to land a little bit more on Team Ben than Team Jake. But but I feel bad about it. I want to land on Team Jake. All I want is for you to feel bad about it. (laughs) I don't feel bad about it. Not listening. (laughs) (laughs) To me, it's like a nails on chalkboard scene. It's like, no. Ah. Don't you like a nice MLT? <laughs> Mutton uh, lettuce. lettuce, <laughs> lettuce Mutton's so. nice and juice. <laughs> nice <Goodness>. and lean. <laughs> nice and lean. <laughs> He's so gross. Uh, <laughs> well, Ben, you are a um, virulent anti-Semite, and I think that's really what this is all about, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yep. Because I, right. I said something else was the most Jewish part of the movie, but I'd forgotten about Miracle Max. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here and say <laughs> Miracle most... Max might just be the most Jewish part of the movie. Uh, you're out on that limb. <laughs> <laughs> Miracle Max, come on. Not at all the way that Miracle Max is just another silly character. Don't go swimming for at least uh, an hour. Do you think they'll do it? It would take a miracle. I do like that. I like the scene. I, I, I wish it was in a different movie. All right, we're coming into the home stretch, though. Act three here. We got on the parapet. They're talking about the Holotoss cloak. Wesley comes alive. Let me explain. No, let me sum up. Yeah, <laughs> there's no time. I love Andre the Giant moving... Wesley's head to <laughs> nod and uh-huh. <laughs> puppeteering. <laughs> yeah, that stuff's all really fun. Uh, and it's nice that Carrie always is allowed to show his cards a little bit and lean into the more comedic side of his character. If only I had a Holocaust qu- cloak in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that? Holo- yeah, it's, it fits so nice. <laughs> Said I could keep it. Why didn't you list that among our assets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how annoyed <laughs> he plays it. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I don't know how much more there actually is to talk about. I mean, we've got... They, they get into the castle. Oh, you mean this key? We've got all that. We already, we already talked about the priest. Uh-huh. And Fe- Fezzik wraps him up on the uh, statue of armor. Yes, yes, yes. That's great. He puts his arms through. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting there. Uh, oh, you've got a you've got a very fun and samurai like dispatching of several guards yes yes that's pretty great mm-hmm. it's uh, really fun and then count ruben One, two, turning three. tail and running is is pretty great yeah um and then you have the final duel which is pretty great and obviously the highlight of the kid of the, of the highlight of the kid the highlight of mm-hmm. the movie for for any young boy who's watching it my problem with that scene is with the writing i uh, this is what i alluded to earlier the big cliffhanger of the beginning of this movie mm. I, I think it would be better if Count Rugen organically offered the, him those things, I, I don't like how successfully he's able to stage his own perfect revenge by saying, offer me this, offer me this. I mean, I know it's like an iconic part of the movie, but I think it would be better if it was just wrung from Count Rugen's cowardly soul that he wanted to offer him those things. I love it 
I love that he's played this scenario out a million times in his head. He knows exactly what his line is, and he and if Rugen's not going to give it to him, he's going to make him give it to him. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's I. I don't know. I guess I my job on this podcast is to be the apologist for the movie exactly as it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is your job. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it's a great scene. Uh, it's not as good of a sword fight in it, taken as a sword fight, I think, as the first one in the movie. No, but it but it is more satisfying as a visceral like get yeah. him, get the bad guy. Yeah, I don't well, know that you'd like want it to be. Punches you in the gut when it when Rugen's there waiting and throws the dagger in uh-huh. his gut. Yeah. Oh no, we've waited this whole movie for this moment. And then he gets the dagger in the gut. I'm sorry, Father. I tried. Mm-hmm. Well, and I love, I mean, it's so funny as an adult to watch and realize the movie unapologetically just has, because this is the kind of thing that happens in these stories with, with no explanation. He's got a dagger in the gut. He's gone down. And then he's just going to will himself back to life and it's going to turn into a flesh wound because <laughs> because that's the thing. Because that's that, what the movie needs. That's what the, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no explanation. He's going to you know. gain steam as he goes right? along. <laughs> the more yeah. he says his line and then he's just back to pretty much normal by by the end yeah um, it's fun R- Rugen gets to play it gets to reprise himself in the the pit of despair for one not, well not, my my goodness are you still going to fight or whatever it is yeah. he says yeah. uh-huh. how sad or something like that yeah uh-huh. yeah no no Rugen's great yeah. And, yeah and it shouldn't be as but as good of a sword fight it should just be more of a visceral we're hacking at each other until one of us dies yeah, and i repeat every mark on you that you've made on me it's good stuff scar your cheekbones stab your shoulders and then stab you through the heart and if we're allowed to on this christian podcast defend the use of a bad word what an iconic part of my childhood and what if if you had gotten into a bad word uh, what a perfect placement for mm-hmm. it and i think all the boys on the playground liked that line quite a bit so yeah pretty awesome scene and then I, lo- I love that we give the cathartic emotional stuff to Inigo. And then we have the to the pain scene <laughs> with Wesley. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> well, and what a great piece of writing because you could imagine this feeling like such a disappointment. They, they set it up even earlier with Fred Savage where he's who gets Humperdinck. Nobody gets Humperdinck. He survives. Hmm. And Fred Savage is confused. And Peter Falk knows it's going to pay off for him anyway. He doesn't have to worry about it. And the movie actually pulls that off. We're not going to kill the guy. We're not going to change his status he's he lives he's still prince as far as we know like he he in some sense in one sense he got away with it but the movie tells us he didn't because he's gonna live with his cowardice and that speech really sells it yeah um ringing in your perfect ears <laughs> <laughs> wrong your ears you'll keep and i'll tell you why <laughs> it's well echo in your perfect ears <laughs> drop your sword and then the way <laughs> the way he drops his sword and then grabs the skirts <laughs> of his and, and, and kind of sashays over to the chair. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> <it's> hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's perfect and it really works. And I just I don't even know why it works. It it, it seems like it could be so disappointing. I, it's interesting to me that it wasn't disappointing to me as a kid that we don't get a big another big duel there. I guess it's because the duel within a go has been so satisfying. Yeah, I think that's why. Like they, yeah, it's possible, pig. It's yeah. conceivable, you warthog-based buffoon. <laughs> Those insults- I'm only lying here because I like the strength to stand. But then again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so... I knew he was bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Going to tie everything up in a nice with a nice bow. Fezzik did something smart. Inigo would make a wonderful Dread Pirate Roberts. Yeah. And... It's one of the four greatest kisses of all time or or something like that. Fred Savage is uh, entering a new level of understanding and puberty, perhaps, and is coming of age and is excited about the kissing scene. And he wants Grandpa to read it to him again tomorrow, and as you wish. I mean, you just, again, William Goldman as a writer, so totally and undeniably in the pocket. Like, the, this movie just cannot do wrong. It's perfectly written you can argue with the synth score or miracle max or this or that if you want to be a crank or just make an interesting podcast but man. there will be a legion of jakes not letting you yes <laughs> uh, i stand by anti synth score anti miracle max uh, yeah 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 closing thought i kind of rushed us through the end there but because i didn't have a lot to say about any of it but did i yeah i want to ask a tangent question yes did, did either of you guys grow up watching the wonder years with fred savage yep 
You did? Yeah. I've never seen an episode of The Wonder Years. I saw one episode recently with my wife. Okay. And was it wonderful? I wouldn't say it's wonderful. I'd say Fred Savage is awesome. He's really good. I mean, at least I thought he was really good. And it evokes a lot of stuff effectively. It's kind of, it's kind of hammy. Like the, there's a voiceover and narration of adult Fred Savage commenting. Right. It's and it's played by somebody. Uh, it's Ron Howard, I think, isn't it? Is it Ron Howard? Yeah, I think okay. so. And I think that's unfortunate, but it was good. I mean, it was a good episode, single episode that I saw. But I was just thinking of him being at the right time to play that kid coming of age. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he does the same thing in shorthand in Princess Bride, but. Yeah. Lots of little details that just sort of get passed over. The king is, the king and the queen are. Oh, the dot. Yeah. She kissed me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to kill myself. What was that for? You know. You've always been so kind to me, and I won't ever see you again since I'm killing myself. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Or would that be nice? <laughs> and again, Robin Wright could make that stuff so boring if she was boring, but she manages to give just enough life and personality to a very... I think, unfortunately, we have this movie to thank for the rest of Robin Wright's dumb career, where she played you know, the lady on House of Cards and lots of kind of proto-feminist or feminist characters, because I think she really didn't like playing such a passive love object kind of iconic fairy tale role well and but then she's in unbreakable doing the same thing yeah she's good in unbreakable i forgot that was her mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's the only other thing i can remember seeing her in right but she, she definitely did not want to get typecast as buttercup which i suppose is understandable but she's really good at it and mm -hmm. i think it would be nice if she didn't feel as bad about it uh, she's she's always been a good sport about the retrospectives all, all these actors have they they know this is the movie they're going to be remembered for uh -huh. she was in beowulf yes she played the queen mother of course in she beowulf. was jenny was she jenny oh forrest gump oh yeah that's her i forgot that was her of huh. course that's her yeah jenny is like the ultimate yeah i don't really want to be remembered for buddy buttercup character i mean jenny as a character reactionary and yeah, I don't have to explain who Jenny is to anyone who's seen Forrest Gump, but... Which I have not. Well, Jenny is not the kind of character that Princess Buttercup would approve of. Let's just say that. I think she dies of AIDS. Spoiler for a uh, movie that everyone except for you has seen. Pretty shocking that you haven't seen that movie. That would be an interesting one to do on the podcast. See whether we approved of it or not. See whether we liked it. See how I've, it holds up. I've never wanted to see it. No, I don't want to do it either. I'm just saying it would be an interesting <laughs> one. It was not, though. Yay. Robin Wright. Yes, she was Robert Wright Penn for a while. Mary Sean Penn. But like I said, even if she didn't always want to be playing the princess, she has always been a good sport. Everybody's been a good sport. They understand they will be remembered for this. I think Kara Ilways has been a good sport. I'm, I'm sure he's, he'd rather be remembered for this than Saw or Robin Hood Men in Tights. She was 21. 21. Maybe she was 19. I guess she was 19 when they were doing the casting. Because I read a quote where Goldman saw her when she was 19 and was like, oh, yeah, this is our well, this is buttercup. Born in, in 1966 and the movie's 87. Well, that probably means they filmed it in 85. So, Okay. I mean, they, they probably didn't film it the same year it came out. Final thoughts, guy, gentlemen? I think this movie's a piece of garbage. I think anyone who likes it is a piece of garbage. And You've made that very clear. Yeah. How many buttercups out of... Well, not buttercups. How many R-O-U-S's out of 10 do you give to this movie, Ben? And any other final thoughts you might wish to share? I'd probably give it 10. I'm tempted to, to give it 9 just because I don't feel as strong an affection for it as you guys do. But I don't know. I don't have an objective reason for giving it 9 instead of 10. That crappy synth score that ruins the whole thing. <laughs> that ruins the whole thing. That's right. I mean, I, th I think i give it 10. So... You can have a week 10 out of 10. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming Jake's going to give it 10. Uh, Jake, final thoughts and how many ROUS is out of 10? 11. Okay. So Jake's going full. Jake's Rob Reiner all the way. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Go this, on it. Yep. You're this, right. <laughs> this rating scale goes to 11. This rating scale goes to 11. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's Christopher Guest. Christopher Guest is awesome. Yeah. Uh, very funny man uh and married to jamie lee curtis for many many years one of hollywood's great monogamous power couples so da, 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 yeah i'll give it so you gave it a weak 10 jake gave it essentially a strong 10 i'm just gonna give it a straight 10 split things down the middle there you go i do not mean to pry but you don't by any chance happen to have six fingers on your right hand 
do you always begin conversations this way? <laughs> so many great little so lines. So many little nuggets. Yeah. Every line's a winner. I mean, this movie I would put with Casablanca. I would put with just just in terms of movies that just are full of memorable, wonderful, quotable dialogue. I mean, I don't know what the other ones would be, but this this joins the company, the the Hall of Champions. My 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 brain would probably deduct a few points for some of the chintziness of the sets, for the pedestrian way it's filmed, for the the cheesy score, for Miracle Max. But my heart will give it ten, and I think I do have a little bit more affection than Ben does, so I will up his week ten to a a medium ten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think there are things that, as as with any good movie, there are things you can look at and find wanting, but. Yeah. Would the movie have worked better with a better score? Would it have worked better with more elaborate direction, with more interesting cinematography? I don't know. Maybe maybe it plays best exactly the way it is. It certainly seems to have worked for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Again, unless you're one of those people who just hates whimsy and... You mock my pain. And mocks... You mock my pain. Uh, used to disappointment. Get used to disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right. We should also say, before we go, that... Our patron choice award winner of awesomeness is Anthony. Now, Anthony, or Anthony, Ben, why do you think that Anthony deserves to be the patron choice award winner of awesomeness on this particular podcast? Anthony, a dream within a dream (laughs) of a patron. (laughs) Anthony, you seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. <laughs> you seem a decent podcast. I hate to die. <laughs> Humiliations galore. Humiliations galore. What if that's another one. Okay, that's a great line from Miracle Max. Humiliations galore. All right, folks. Until- Anth- oh, An- we, we didn't really answer it. I think we should just say that if Anthony had to overcome three trials through successively weaker assailants, <laughs> he would do it. Yeah. Yep. yep. He would be a match for Vizzini's wits, for Fezzik's strength, and for In- Inigo's steel. steel. Inigo's steel. He would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, very true. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, folks. We'll be back next time with Yojimbo. And uh, that'll be exciting. <laughs> a good way to close out. Hey. <laughs> That's a, you don't have to be ironic. <laughs> Yojimbo will be exciting, folks. Yo, It'll be great. Yojimbo. Um, <laughs> Yojimbo. Yojimbo. Yeah. Maybe I'm yo. Yojimbo. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Adrian. Um, <laughs> Yojimbo. 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 He slices all the bad guys with his sword. <laughs> um, listen, if you're thinking about not watching Yojimbo, you should. It's a fantastic movie. Maybe you'll enjoy it a little bit more academically if you're not into samurai movies, but you'll still see an awful lot of inspiration for an awful lot of the things that you love. And Kurosawa is a great film, and it's one of his – or Kurosawa is a great film. Kurosawa is a great, one of the great filmmakers that the world has ever known, and it's one of his most True. accessible – films true and again we're not making you sit through all three hours of seven samurai although that we we'd be happy to do that too but this one's more fun this one's fun you'll have fun with it so i encourage you to stretch to read some subtitles to watch something in black and white if if you're not inclined to do that i think you might enjoy it and so give it the old college try the, may, may, like, like i said with harold lloyd it's possible if it's just not on your wavelength that you'll it'll be a little bit more academic but i think it'll be pleasant academic and for many of you, it might just be a good movie. Well, it's, it's, I should all, you, we should also say that you get to watch the great Toshiro Mifune, yeah, if what? that's how you pronounce his name. Which is, he's still an awesome and, star. And the other number of actors whose names you don't know how to pronounce. Mm. Yes, but Toshiro Muf- Mifune, arguably one of the great stars of the 20th century, and yeah. just awesome. I don't know who, you, who you'd say. He's, people sometimes say he's the Clint Eastwood of Japan, but that's only because Fistful of Dollars is analogous to... But he's he's much more energetic and sort of weird and silly and almost more of a Brad Pitt meets Clint East. I don't know what to say, but like if Clint Eastwood was willing to set, could could do the whole glowering thing, but then would suddenly be silly and beat his chest and run around and kind of that's more his character from Seven Samurai. But the point is, he's got a weird range of intense things that he can do, and he's he's, he's a lot of fun to watch. He's a lot of fun to watch. Very compelling actor. And Kurosawa, one of the great, one of the world's great filmmakers. So that's next time. It'll be two weeks from now. Yo, Jimbo. Yo, Jimbo. And until next time, folks, 
This is true love. You think this happens every day? <laughs> <laughs>